All right, so uh, we are Good evening. Uh, if everybody could come in and uh, we'll get uh, we'll get going here. I know people are filtering in still, um, but I'm really uh, let's get everybody settled here. Forum on Reforming Government. On behalf of Represent Pennsylvania, Clean Money Squad PA, and March on Harrisburg, thanks for making the effort to, to attend this evening. My name is Peter Willette. I'm the state coordinator for Represent Pennsylvania, a chapter of the national organization Represent Us, the largest all volunteer, grassroots, nonpartisan anti-corruption movement in the country. Um, Represent Us advocates for the passage of the American Anti-Corruption Act and its principles at the local, state, and national levels. I'm also managing director of Clean Money Squad PA, an organization that identifies candidates and office holders that endorsed the American Anti-Corruption Act at the local and state levels in Pennsylvania. I currently serve on the Luzerne County Board of Elections, and I receive no monetary compensation for any of these positions. I serve because I care. Before we get going tonight, I want to acknowledge the efforts of all the volunteers who uh, made this evening's event possible and allowed it to be free to the public. I'm gonna make special thanks to General Rosado. Some of, you, some of you may know Gemma as an outspoken progressive activist, a dependable and courageous volunteer, and then there are her Facebook posts. <laughs> Gemma conceived this event, booked the space, secured technical help, marshaled the help of our volunteers, contacted the speakers, donated her time and money to make sure that anyone who wanted to attend could attend. All right, on your seats, you found a form you can use to question the panelists, and note at the bottom of the form is a place to indicate your interest in volunteering with one of the organizations, or all of the organizations, or two of the organizations, sponsoring tonight's uh, uh, forum. We want to encourage a civil exchange of ideas this evening. So we encourage you to ask a question. We're asking the panelists to make some short remarks, and then we will open the floor to your questions and discussion. My hope this evening is that all of you come away with a new way of thinking about your government. I hope you'll be inspired to act, to get involved with your government, and perhaps inspire your friends and neighbors to act with you. We all hear the comment, I'm just not that into politics. Oops. <coughs> Let me remind you, so you can remind others that your boss, your bank, your insurance company, your landlord are into politics. They use their influence every day to enact policy that affects your life every day. I also want you to be aware that something expressed this evening by a panelist or audience member will likely anger you. If you are not angered by something this evening, we've failed in one of our missions. I hope you use that anger constructively. And uh, remember back in grade school when the teacher said, put your thinking caps on? 
let's put our thinking caps on. I'd like to take an informal survey, okay? You may choose to respond or not. You may feel that some of the questions are too personal. But uh, let's start out with, do we have any re uh, registered Republicans in the room? Not one. <laughs> Democrats? Registered Democrats? Wow. I guess they're just not into politics. Um, libertarians? Do we have any uh, other third, uh, Greens? Do we have any Greens in the audience? Great. Uh, any other third parties? Good, good. Registered independent or unaffiliated? Yeah, great. okay, great. Um, how many of you would describe yourself as politically liberal? Okay. Conservative? Progressive? How many of you would describe yourself as socially liberal? Okay. Conservative, socially conservative, progressive. Okay. Economically, would you consider yourself low income? Yeah. <laughs> Middle income? Okay. Upper income? Super rich? Do we have any super rich in the audience? Um, <clears throat> now I want you to think about your government. Do we live in a democracy? Who thinks we live in a democracy? Who thinks we live in a republic? Who thinks we live in a democratic republic? How about an oligarchy? <laughs> Are you generally happy with the way your local governments work? Okay. How about your school board? How about your state government? How about the federal government? Okay, just want to make sure you're thinking about these things. Are you generally lo happy with your uh, local uh, elected representatives? How about your school board members? Generally happy with them? How about your uh, how about your state senator? State senator. Generally happy with your state senator? How about uh, your state representative? Generally happy with their performance? They represent you well. How about uh, congressperson? Federal congressperson. Uh, state senators or uh, federal senators, senators in the administration. We got two. We got mixed feelings going on here, I think. One's a good guy, one's not so good. All right. And you can choose whichever one that is. I'm not making any judgments here. Um, and again, for, and, and this is just the last few questions, um, I promise. You don't have to answer now. Just think about it. Think for a moment about your governments, your local, your county, your school board, your state government, your federal government. Do they work for you as you would like them to? And how would you like them to work for you? Think about that. And what do you think is keeping these governments from acting in your best interest? Think about the kind of person you'd like to represent you in your governments. Do you know that person? Is that person you? I'd like to, to keep all of these things in mind as this evening progresses. Just make some mental notes as we go along. And with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Adam Eichen is a co-author of Daring Democracy with Francis Moore LePay. I believe you guys work together in some capacity. Um, we're really honored to have him here. I'm gonna also introduce the other two, but Adam goes first. <laughs> and also we have uh, Rabbi Mark Michael Pollack, who's the executive director for March on Harrisburg. Um, I've known Michael now for about a year. 
and he has the most amazing insights into Harrisburg. Um, he's done a lot of work there. Uh, March on Harrisburg has been um, in the forefront of uh, nonviolent civil disobedience in Harrisburg and has drawn attention to many, many of the issues, uh, important issues that need to be changed in this state. And finally, Professor Lawrence Lessig, I don't know how much of an introduction you need, <laughs> but one of, the, uh, one of the consultants, one of the authors of the American Anti-Corruption Act, um, and a very well-known author uh, and scholar. With that, Adam I. so much and I want to thank everyone for coming out today and Gemma especially for putting this together when I think you said this the last uh, we were in this area for those of you who don't know Michael and I went across the entire Commonwealth see look at me I call it a Commonwealth because I spent a whole month in this Commonwealth not state because I got in trouble for saying that <laughs> going across to 20 different cities across the Commonwealth to talk about democracy. And my very last event, our very last event, was in Wyoming Valley. And so some folks here, I saw that last event, and I think the look on our faces were of fatigue and utter exhaustion and just, uh, I don't even know. But so, you know, see, I look a little more fresh-faced now because we've had a little bit of time to uh, relax, but not too much because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so right now, so it's really since that moment that I was here last, um, I actually joined Equal Citizens, which is an organization that I'm sure uh, Professor Lessig will talk about later, um, and we can talk about it in the Q&A as their communications strategist, and we're doing some really interesting stuff, which we can get to. But I had a whole speech planned today, and then I woke up, and I don't know who saw the news today, but I turned on my phone, and I saw that a certain somebody named Dinesh D'Souza was pardoned by the president. And Dinesh D'Souza, for whatever you think of his political beliefs, committed, a, you know, I, I don't know if technically, Larry, you can tell me it was a felony, but I'm pretty sure it was a felony. He violated federal campaign finance laws. Mm -hmm. And the president pardoned him, saying that his conviction was politically motivated. <laughs> but not only that, he then continued and said later that he was thinking about pardoning Rod Blagojevich, the former governor of Illinois, who is in jail for, I believe, 18 years for attempting to sell a Senate seat. So we're now in the process, not only of fighting de corruption as systematic dependence, as Larry has written so much about, but now the president is seemingly justifying quid pro quo corruption. We are now on such a defensive here that we are defending quid pro quo. So I had a lot planned today, and that kind of threw me off because I wasn't really feeling like defending quid pro quo. But I realized I don't think we have to. Because the president campaigned on draining the swamp. And it sounds silly in hindsight, certainly, and for many of us it sounded silly then, too. But for many people that message truly resonated, and rightfully so. Whether you supported Bernie Sanders, or Donald Trump, or even Hillary Clinton for that matter, the messages were relatively the same when it came to our broken democracy. The system is broken. There's a reason that message resonated. So while I don't really want to defend quid pro quo, I, I was thinking, what is the silver lining here? And I have to say, it's that the veneer of draining the swamp is so far removed, it's so far gone, that there's no pretense of draining the swamp. There's no pretense of fighting corruption. There's the only the reality of populating that swamp. And that opens up a major, it's a major opening for all of us. It's a major possibility for those of us who have long recognized that our democracy is broken to start integrating new people in to this fight. Because no one who has any grasp of what is going on can say that the system is working properly. And as soon as we're getting up against that wall of quid pro quo, there are very few people on no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, who are going to justify that. And Donald Trump, for his credit, said, well, look at me, I'm pardoning a Democrat and a Republican for corruption, but I have more faith in the American people to see right through that and see that as pardoning corruption, not bipartisanship. That is not the bipartisanship we need in our country. 
So, how do we then make that opening bigger? Because right, th we have an opening here for those of us who care about democracy. You know, we'll talk a lot about how our democracy is broken, but I want to go into what do we do with it? What do we do with this opening? And I, I want to posit three things. The first is we really have to understand how we got here. How do we even get to a situation where Drain the Swamp was so popular? How do we get to a situation where the outsider is the insider? Where alienation, political, social, economic alienation just plagues our nation? How did we get here? So I want to leave a lot of room for Q&A, so I'm going to keep this brief. But as Peter said, I, I wrote a book on this subject about how we got here, and many people have. I want to kind of give a quick condensed summary of this. I really believe, and I believe the historical evidence backs this up, that there was a concerted effort, a deliberate, long-term effort to undermine our democracy, to, to undermine our democratic institutions. And you really can trace its legacy back to former Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell. Before he was a Supreme Court Justice, he wrote a, a memo, now called, called the Powell Memo, um, in which he wrote it to the Chamber of Commerce, a conglomeration of the biggest corporations in American society. And basically what he said, he said, if corporations, if the wealthiest among us are going to get their power back, right, after the 1960s, all these disenfranchised communities all of a sudden started making their voices heard. The Civil Rights Movement, the Women's Liberation Movement, the Environmental Movement, people were making claims on government and government was responding to those claims. And so corporations were a little bit on the defensive. And so what Powell said, if you're serious here, you got to go on the offensive. You have to have someone in DC for all of your firms. You got to start taking politics back. And so they created what in, in daring democracy we call the anti-democracy movement, because really at its core is a movement to undermine the very foundation of our democracy. And this movement funded by the wealthiest among us, really just a cabal, a small group of billionaires and you know, maybe a hundred millionaires, you know, Koch brothers, the DeVos family, Skate Foundation, now the Mercer family, funding things to change the narrative of society from think tanks to deregulating the media to funding textbooks and public education, or defunding public education rather, funding certain college chairships for, for professors, changing the way Americans think so that we begin to lose faith in our ability to collectively come together, that we no longer have theory about the public good, only the private good, that the market is that which, which uh, allocates everything efficiently, certainly not government institutions. There's been a long-standing effort to delegitimize government. You see it in the words of Newt Gingrich, who in the 1980s, he was the former Speaker of the House, not quite at this point, but before he was Speaker of the House, said that the partisan struggle has to be fought with the scale, the duration, and the savagery of civil war. So the name of the game isn't to compromise, it's to kill your enemy, it's to destroy. Politics is a bloodbath. Millions of Americans no longer aspire to public service because it's so dirty and ugly. You have to have a thick skin if you want to do something good in this world. But that's one side, really ch changing the way that we think as Americans about democracy itself. And I just want to quickly say, one of the best examples of delegitimizing government, I think, was in 2013, um, when a, a group of 30 people, Republicans, of course, uh, decided to hold the government hostage and shut down the government for 17 days over budget negotiations because no one would defund Obamacare. And that ended up costing the taxpayers $24 billion. But the, the real key is not the money. Yes, that's bad. But the majority of Americans, after they did that, reported not to have faith that Congress could pass another budget. That's the baseline of a democratic body is to pass a budget. And so people lose faith in their ability to collectively come together. And this is kind of one part of shaping the narrative of democracy in the United States. But the other part is much more insidious, and it's funding efforts to unleash money in politics, restrict the right to vote, to gerrymander. Our last federal election cost $6.4 billion, and it was two-thirds of that money came from one half of 1% of Americans. It's making the Americans that still believe in the public good, still believe that we together can decide our own future. It makes us irrelevant. We can't play the game of politics because they've narrowed the playing field to such a degree. All of us are just watching. And so this movement has been going on for 40 years. 
could go into much more detail here, but the point is that we didn't get to the situation where we had to drain the swamp out of nowhere. It was deliberate. And it sounds like conspiracy theory, but let me tell you, in some respects it is. Because it's a group of people conspiring. And that doesn't mean these are bad people, but they hold a certain worldview. They hold a certain worldview in which this is the society they want, that the minority should dictate the will of the majority. So here we are, where the majority of us, as a Princeton political science study showed, have near zero influence on public policy, while the wealthiest have significant influence. So what do we do with that? If we recognize we didn't get here out of nowhere, what then do we do? One of the hardest parts in the A in this, whether it's under the Trump presidency or even when Obama was president, was to get people to believe that they can do something about this. Because that same political science study I just said, I just cited, was looking at data from the 80s and 90s. So our system was broken well before Trump, well before Obama. We had our work cut out for us decades ago. So what do we do now? I believe that we have to show people that there are policies that can fix it. People get deterred because the problem is so big that to fix our democracy, well, where do we begin? So let's actually talk about solutions. Let's talk about what we can do, what states across the country, across the country are actually doing right now to push democracy forward. So I want to focus a little bit about that because I don't think we talk enough about the fact that states across the country are actually passing reform and have passed reform that are, that's working, that is enfranchising all Americans, that democratizes political fundraising, that fixes gerrymandering, that pushes democracy to where it's never been. So let's start quickly with the state of Maine. Maine is a fascinating place. I don't know how much you think about it. I live in Boston, so we think about it relatively frequently. It's just a quick hop and a skip over the state border. In Maine in 1996, the Ballot Initiative, they passed something called Clean Elections. The basic premise is politicians spend way too much time fundraising. <clears throat> what if we make them show a little bit of grassroots support, saying, OK, collect $5 from 50 people, and we'll fund your campaign. And there's actually a story that we tell in the book that the person leading the campaign tried to get a pollster to poll the question, to see what their chances were. And the pollster said, we can't poll this. You have no shot of winning. It would be unethical for us to do this. This is never going to happen. I don't want to take your money. They ended up winning by 12%. And so now Maine has clean elections. And instead of spending time fundraising, usually out-of-state fundraising, to billionaires and millionaires, they talk to 50 people in their constituency. And there's one person, I think, just exemplifies this, what this law can do. Deb Simpson was a waitress in Maine. And someone said, Deb, you have all of the qualifications, you have all the intellect and, and ability to be a politician. You should run. She said, I can't run. I can't run. How can I run? I'm a waitress. I can't afford it. I said, Deb, $5 to 50 people. She said, I'm a waitress. I talk to 50 people every day. I can do that. So she did. She became a five-term poli five politician. It was one of the most beloved politicians in the United States, or in Maine, rather. Mm -hmm. She would have never had a shot had we not had public financing. Seattle is another great example. In 2017, for the first time, they used a voucher system. Vouchers, basically, it was uh, every resident gets four $25 vouchers that they can use to any local politician. And what you saw is you had homeless people giving money for the first time. Mm -hmm. And that changes the debate. All of a sudden, homelessness is part of the discussion. And you should read the testimonies of people who are homeless who gave. They say things like, I've never felt a part of my community, and now I do. I mean, imagine the radical shift in how you would feel as a citizen when you give money for the first time. The name of the game changes. When you're talking about changing campaign finance, you're ultimately talking about the intersection of politics and economics. It's a really unsexy issue, but it has some of the largest consequences of any policy debate in America. And vouchers and Maine system and New York City has a different system. These are all ways to completely and fundamentally alter the United States and how our decisions are made. But it's not just money in politics. 
it's voting rights too. And there are many efforts in the United States to push voting rights forward. Because as states have been um, suppressing the vote, some states are pushing it forward. And one of them that I just want to give you an idea, a taste of what's possible is Oregon. In Oregon in 2015, they passed automatic voter registration. And it sounds wonky and in some ways it is, but it's really simply this. Anytime you interact with a governmental agency that's participating in the program, they automatically register you when you interact. So when you go to the DMV and fill out all that information, you know you fill out 16 times at 16 different agencies. They say, let's just streamline this. We have the information. We, the government, will send it over to the Board of Elections and make sure you are registered. In the first three months of this program, the rate of new registrations tripled. 275,000 people were registered using ADR. And of those, 100,000, almost 100,000 voted for the first time. When you lift the barriers to registration, people use the franchise. We have to lift those barriers up to allow people to make their voice heard. And now since Oregon became the first state, 12 more states have followed suit. And Massachusetts is now on the verge, a campaign that Equal Citizens endorses and is participating in. Massachusetts is likely going to be next. And there are many other efforts, but the only one I want to give a shout out before I hand over the mic is Florida. Because we have this thing called, or had a thing called Jim Crow in this country. And I, I hate to break it to you, but there's still many vestiges of Jim Crow. We may not like to think about it. But one of the most disgusting pieces of legislation still in the books, mainly in the South, is something called felon disenfranchisement laws. That because the turn of the century, they couldn't take away the vote for African Americans. What they did is they made it so that if you're convicted of a felony, you can take the right to vote away. And so there are 10 states now that still, if you're convicted of a felony, and we all know which way the criminal justice system skews when it comes to the color of your skin, you will never get the right to vote back unless you're individually pardoned by the governor or a clemency board. There are approximately 6.1 million Americans who cannot vote because of a, a felony conviction. 1.5 of those live in Florida. <coughs> Remember that whole 2000 election where it was decided by 537 votes? There are 1.5 million felons who could not vote in that election. Many of those did nothing wrong. There's one story of a woman who, when she was 19, I believe, stole diapers for her child because she couldn't afford them. And she got a felony conviction and 40 years later could not vote at any point in her life. But Florida right now, they collected 770,000 signatures to get it on the ballot in 2018. And if it passes by 60%, it will be overturned. And voting rights will be restored to 1.5 million people in Florida. This is just a taste of what's happening because this gets me to the last point I wanna make, is that there is a movement across the country fighting for democracy reform. There is a movement. No one talks about it, but in whatever state you live in, there are people fighting for democracy reform. They're fighting for some of the policies I listed, some of them I didn't listen. Some people are fighting to lower the voting age to 16. Some people are looking for universal voter registration where everyone is registered at the age of 18. There are many ways to push your democracy forward and people are out there making it happen. Because that's the only way this policy is going to be passed. Yeah, it's great that I can point to Maine as an example of public financing, but our fight is not over when it comes to money and politics until every state has public financing, and that includes your state of Pennsylvania. Commonwealth. <laughs> Listen, I've been gone for two months, okay? Although really, someone once pointed out that I also live in Massachusetts, which I believe is also a Commonwealth. So I really have no excuse. The point is, there is a movement, but this movement has to grow. Because if we're ever going to achieve that moment where all 50 states have public financing, all 50 states have automatic voter registration, all 50 states make it so everybody can vote and everybody has a voice, regardless if you're poor or if you are rich, regardless of the color of your skin, the only way we get there is through a dynamic, dynamic, intergenerational, cross-issue, cross-partisan, grassroots movement. Because that is the only way 
we can actually win against big money forces. Because they will throw out all the stops against us to make sure that we have minority rule, not majority rule, because that is how they win. So don't think they're gonna give us that power easily. But I wanna leave you with this, the fact that we have won in places, in pockets across the country despite the best wishes of this anti-democracy movement, the fact that we even have public financing in Maine, the fact that automatic voter registration is even a thing, despite the fact that I could point to any example where our democracy is being pushed forward. That is enough to give me hope and to show the power of what is possible when we come together as citizens to fight for a higher good, for something as sacred as democracy itself. So as bad as things are, as bad and as upset as I was when I woke up this morning to see quid pro quo corruption, Again, quid pro quo corruption being pardoned. I also saw the door opening ever wider for that movement to grow. And all of you in this audience are part of that movement. And we have to make it even larger and more dynamic. And if there's ever a state that should lead the nation, it's Pennsylvania. Oh, you got it. <laughs> to be back up here. It's been a few months. So we are in the state of Pennsylvania, and I want to give a few facts about where we are right now. I'm sorry, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And we are in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and this is the fifth most corrupt state in the Union. According to the Electoral Integrity Project report of 2016, we ranked 45th in the country across 11 metrics of democracy. We are the bottom of the barrel when it comes to northeastern states, by far. Across those 11 metrics of democracy, we are failing across most of them. In Pennsylvania, you can legally gift anything to any state legislator, and I mean anything. Brand new car, expensive vacation, endless whining and dining. A personal check is legal. Cash gifts are legal in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, we have no limits on campaign finance. We have a Senate candidate, a state Senate candidate here with us tonight. Anybody in this room, if you had the funds, you could cut him a $1 million check. <laughs> if you have the funds, I think you'd like to find you. <laughs> and that's totally legal. Pennsylvania, we are, depending on who you ask, the 48th or 49th, I'm sorry, 46th, 47th, 48th, or 49th most gerrymandered state in the union. We have made strides with online registration in the last few years, but we are still woefully inadequate at making our democracy inclusive and making our ballot inclusive. So what does this mean for all of us? What does this mean for our day-to-day -day lives? It means a, a whole lot. Pennsylvania has, sorry, one in eight children in the state and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania lives in deep poverty. One in eight children in this commonwealth lives in deep poverty. One in two children in this commonwealth lives in a household that is either in poverty or right on the verge of being in poverty. How many other states love their kids more than we do? Most of them. Why is that? Why does this happen? How do we get here? The prophet Isaiah spoke 2,600 years ago and said, your rulers are like rebels partners with thieves. They chase after bribes. The widow and the orphan's case does not come before them. Because when bribery is legal, and when the decision-making table has such a high cost of access, most people can't afford access to the table. And as the retired representative Barney Frank once said, if you're not, if you're not at the table, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. <laughs> I think everyone in this room is on the menu. Pennsylvania, as a, as a commonwealth, we produce 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions come from within our borders, whether we're burning the fuel here or sending it overseas. How does that happen? 
That happens when you have 203 registered lobbyists for the natural gas industry in Harrisburg, a one-to-one -one ratio between state reps and lobbyists for this one industry. And they are allowed to gift anything. I'll tell you, I spent a lot of time in the Capitol. I see natural gas lobbyists as much as I see legislators. They're everywhere. They're in every room, they're at every table, they're in every committee hearing, they're walking out of every office. I walk into an office, I see two natural gas lobbyists who are just finishing up their last meeting. And I see the next two who are coming after me. They're everywhere. And so we produce 1% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. We can't even tax the industry. We're the only gas producing state that can't even manage to tax our industry. And at the same time, our neighbors to the north and the south are banning fracking. And we're not even having that conversation in Harrisburg, because they have so dominated the discourse. What does corruption mean for us? We're suffering through an opioid epidemic right now. I saw someone in my neighborhood on the corner last week who was in the middle of a, a bad day. <laughs> and how does that happen? How do we get here? Are, are we in Congressman Marino's district, by the way, right now? No. Uh, he's a little north? Yeah. West. So, so Congressman Marino, I want to I highlight him tonight uh, when it comes to opioids. Because Congressman Marino, first he should have never been sent to Congress. His district was gerrymandered. It was drawn so that he would win. It was a rigged election from the get-go. Reverend William Barber says, we don't need Russia's help to rig our elections. We can do it ourselves, thank you very much. And we can, and we do. And Marino's election was rigged from the get-go. And he goes to Washington, D.C., and he does what a whole lot of congressmen do. And I'm saying congressmen because we're in Pennsylvania. You know, we have 18 congresspeople, and all of them are men. Marino goes to D.C., and he does what a lot of congressmen do, which is whoever your donors are, whoever your benefactors are, you do their bidding. And his benefactors, one of the big ones, is uh, Big Pharma, the people who make our, our opioids. And he went to D.C., and he started badgering and pestering and abusing and intimidating the Drug Enforcement Agency for years until he was finally able to push through a policy change that makes it illegal for the DEA to remove obviously suspicious shipments of opioids off the streets. When the DEA sees 9 million pills getting shipped from a pharma uh, factory to a small town in western Pennsylvania of 300 people, and they know this, is, this stinks from, you know, from the get-go, this is wrong. They can't do anything. They can't do anything anymore. The prophet Ezekiel said 2,700 years ago, in you are people who take bribes to shed blood. That's the world we're living in. We have people among us who take bribes to shed blood. We have a long way to go. And I want to make clear in this, in this first part here, corruption affects every single issue. We just went through opioids, the environment, and uh, child poverty. I could give you the same talk on education, on infrastructure spending, on gambling, on animal cruelty, everything. You want the animal cruelty one really quickly? <laughs> it's, it's, it blows my mind. In 2014, there was a bill in Pennsylvania, in Harrisburg, that would make it illegal, uh, make pigeon shoots illegal. Pigeon shoots are when you, it's, it's bird torture, essentially. And uh, the bill also contained a provision to ban the eating of cats and dogs. That bill was stopped. It was blocked. The NRA came in in 2014 and spread $30,000 among a few select committee members, including the majority leader at the time, Mike Terza, who's now our speaker. And that was enough. They blocked it, passed the Senate with a supermajority vote. Polling said Pennsylvanians approve of this three to one. Couldn't get through the House. And that's how it works on every single issue across the board. Corruption, corruption, corruption. Why? Because we are separated from the decisions that govern our lives. At the heart of it, we are separated from the decisions that govern our lives. We don't have a seat at the table. So, this is a problem, if you all agree. <laughs> so, we started March on Harrisburg to help be part of the solution. And I also do want to say a word about the, the democracy movement writ large. It is a large movement. There are many, many groups that are active at this stuff across Pennsylvania, across the United States of America, and it must be that way. We need groups and groups and groups and groups organizing, coordinating, and 
pursuing their own passion projects and everything and coming together and moving this ball forward. This isn't the type of movement where there's going to be one nonprofit at the head of it all pushing everyone. No, no, no. This is, this is forward together, not one step back. So March on Harrisburg. We've been active for uh, oh, 20 months or so at this point. We are a nonpartisan, volunteer-driven, statewide organization that is dedicated to healing our wounded democracy and to restoring trust to the Commonwealth. We lobby, we march, and we do nonviolent direct action. In the past year and a half or so, we have lobbied, I just want to say everybody except for Representative Metcalf at this point. <laughs> there were, we'll get to that. There were actually two legislators who uh, he was able to scare enough to not meet with us. So I don't think we're quite at 252 out of the 253, but we're, we're pretty close. And we, we met with all of them many times over. Uh, we've marched. We've done two marches. The first one was from Philadelphia to Harrisburg last May. We marched 105 miles over nine days. And last November, we went from Lancaster to Harrisburg, uh, 36 miles over three days. And we do nonviolent civil disobedience. We have now done... How many actions? Eight. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> uh, eight. I'm going to say eight. Eight actions resulting in 42 arrests in the last year and a half or so, all trying to move our bills. Right now we are advocating for two bills in particular. One is the gerrymandering bill, and I'll talk about that in a second. And the second one is the gift ban. Because before we can get to publicly uh, financed elections, before we can get to campaign finance reform in any serious way, we, we really have to take care of the gifts. It's just the most blatant bribery that we have out there. And so we're working on these, and we're moving them. And our goal as an organization is to, over the next, I'd like to say a decade to be optimistic, but it's probably going to take a bit longer than that, we're going to pass a wave of reform bills in Pennsylvania to build a democracy brick by brick, bill by bill, starting with gerrymandering and the gift ban moving into automatic voter registration, campaign finance reform, publicly funded elections, same day registration, election day as a national holiday, no excuse absentee ballot reform, and about 15 other bills on the list. We look around. <laughs> we look around at our neighbors and we see good ideas. There are ways to fix these problems. There are ways to reconnect we the people to the decisions that govern our lives. We look internationally and we see that other countries have democracies and they seem to function. When we lobby for automatic voter registration, the line that works the best, with, uh, especially with Republicans in our government, is, you know, even Iraq has automatic voter registration. <laughs> I think we can do better. Yeah. <laughs> bill by bill, we're going to build a democracy. And I want to take a moment to just address one of these bills in particular, because it's kind of in the air, and a few people have already asked about it, and rather than wait till Q&A, let's just get right at it. Gerrymandering. Who's been following gerrymandering news lately? Raise your hand. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so gerrymandering. So what's happening? So last week, in the Senate State Government Committee, they passed SB 22 out of committee. Senate Bill 22 is the bill that we've been advocating for for quite some time now. Now, the bill that they passed is not what we were advocating for. It's not quite the same in a very key difference. There's a very key difference in the point there. What we were advocating for is something called random selection, meaning people would qualify to be in a pool of, of potential map makers, and then there would be a, a jury duty style selection, a, a random selection at the end of the day to, to pick people out of that pool. And that has been swapped out, and what has been swapped in is the legislature appoints the commissioners. So instead of it being a truly independent, nonpartisan citizens commission, it's not. But don't panic, because this is a long journey, as any democratic process is. And so I'll say, as March on Harrisburg, we are not urging senators to vote against SB 22. And that might sound a little counterintuitive, and, and here's why. Because this advances the democratic process. And the democratic process is long, and there are many, many opportunities at every step of the way to make changes. And so our current strategy, and actually while I'm explaining this, please take out your phones. I'm going to give you a phone number in a second. But our, our current strategy is to get it through the Senate, this version of the bill that we have now, 
And then when we get a house version of the bill, to have random selection be a key component of that bill, and in the reconciliation process, we'll get random selection out of it, and that, that's our position and what we're pushing. The majority leader, Dave Reed, who has an ax to grind when it comes to this. You know, he's retiring from politics this year, so he says. And he's retiring from politics this year because he was going to run for Congress. And he was going to run in a very gerrymandered district out west. But the Supreme Court stepped in and redrew the district, and all of a sudden he was looking at a race that he might not be able to win. So he decided to drop out of the congressional race. And he had already failed to file for re-election to the State House, so he's going home. <laughs> And he wants to solve this problem. And he says random selection is his red line. That's his sticking point. And so he said last week in a meeting, they're going to be introducing the bill soon. We are encouraging people to support uh, his actions and his intentions and encourage his office to introduce that bill as soon as possible. Because you know in Harrisburg, they say soonish and then 10 things pop up and then it never happens. So uh, please take down this phone number, 717. 705-7173. This is Majority Leader Dave Reed's Capitol Office. Please call this phone number after this event tonight. Please call it tomorrow morning. Please call it tomorrow when you're eating lunch. Please call it tomorrow when you're waiting on dinner. Please call it tomorrow when you're eating dinner and after dinner as well. And leave a voicemail to the extent that says, I support random selection. I support a truly independent, nonpartisan citizens commission. And Majority Leader Reed, if you introduce that bill that you say you are, we got your back. And please introduce it tomorrow. Now I'm happy that Peter took that poll about kind of what's the political orientation in this room. So what I'm about to say might convince you not to make that call, but I hope it doesn't. If nothing changes, if we don't fix gerrymandering in Pennsylvania, if we don't have a constitutional amendment, if nothing changes before 2021, do you know who benefits the most? No. The Democrats. And the Democrats are licking their lips and waiting. They're waiting and hoping that nothing happens. And the Republicans, they have the most to lose because they're gonna lose a whole lot of power if nothing changes. And they're trying to give us right now a compromise bill that still lets them have some power. And the reform community, us, we really hold a lot of power here. We've escalated these issues. We've elevated these issues. We've put a little bit of you know, fear of God into their eyes out there. And we need to wield that power. To let you know how, what the Democrats are thinking, last week I, I was in a meeting with uh, Minority Leader Dermody's office. And I started the meeting by saying, I'm sorry that I look a little exhausted. I, uh, I just got out of jail at midnight last night. Uh, I hope that's OK. Sorry, I smell a little funky, too. Uh, and I'll, I'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, and, and, and his office, we went there and we said, hey, here's what's happening in the center right now. I wanted to make sure you were aware. And that this seems to be a partisan power grab that we're witnessing. And we just want to make sure your office is aware. And they said, yep, we're, we're on it. We're, gonna, we're calling this one Diet Metcalf. We're calling it Metcalf Light, and we're going to go after it. I said, that's good, but what I don't want you to do is just tell the world what shouldn't happen. Take a leadership stance. Stand up and say, I want an independent, nonpartisan citizens commission. I want this done right. And his office took the same position that they've taken for the last year, which is, we're against an independent, nonpartisan citizens commission because we get the maps in 2021. This is literally what the, the staffer who literally gerrymanders the maps, this is what he said. He said, he said this back in November, he said, uh, I know that what I'm doing is destroying democracy, okay. but I'm doing it anyways, and here's why. Because I look across the aisle and I see crazy people. And I think that the Democratic Party is, is going to save the world. And that's what we need. And so I'm willing to rig the maps, I'm willing to do it all. And they're eager to do it. They're sad about it, but they're eager. And they're planning on it. And they're hoping for it. And every time we meet with their office, they also tell us, you know how you have uh, uh, 110 reps signed on to this bill? You know how you have you know, 88 Democrats signed, or 83 Democrats or whatever signed on to the bill? I guarantee you that you know, half of them are going to vote against it when it actually comes to the floor. They're just doing this to appease their constituents. They're just doing this to appease their voters. They don't really mean it. 
It's hard to know how, how much to believe them on that. But I think there's some truth to it. And they say every time, this is a war against the Republicans. That's the struggle that we're engaged in, the partisan struggle. As Adam said, Newt Gingrich once said, you know, the partisan struggle needs to be fought with the scale, savagery, and duration of civil war. And that, that's what we live in. There's no question about it. And so I said to the, to the gerrymander, I've said this to him many times before, I said, well, the, the way you talk in this office, it reminds me of, of what I've seen in the Middle East. Uh, I've done some peace building work between Israelis and Palestinians. I said, this, this, the, what you're saying, these themes, these patterns of your speech and your thought are the exact same. There's, there's no difference here. Because what you're saying is, I need to attack the other side before they can attack me. I need to take as much power as I can, as quickly as I can, and as thoroughly as I can. Because I don't want the other side to have that power, because they're going to use it against me. I can't compromise. I can't work with them. I don't trust them. I hate them. I despise them. They're not legitimate. Everything they say is based in falsehoods and lies. This is what it sounds like when you're a war zone. When you can't work together on issues of common concern, when the Democratic and the Republican caucuses can't even come together to pass a budget on time. Right? We've had three straight years now where we haven't gotten a budget through on time. The solution, and I don't even want to call it a solution, the, the end of the last budget crisis this past fall, was that the state of Pennsylvania took out a $300 million loan with $250 million of interest attached to it. That's what chaos looks like. That's what it looks like when you can't even make basic decisions, when you can't even come together and govern at all. So I made the point, we have to get away from this mindset of waging war internally and externally. That when the United States of, if the United States of America were to be attacked tomorrow by a foreign government, militarily speaking, we would be able to get a half a million person army together and send them halfway across the world within 48 hours, and they would be ready to be active for years. And they would be well organized, and they would be fed, and they would be housed, and they would be taken care of to the extent that, that the military would. But if we want to organize for peace, we don't seem to have that same muster. We don't seem to have that same drive. We don't seem to have that same will to organize for peace as well as we can organize for war, not even close. We do not wage peace effectively. We wage war very effectively, devastatingly so. I said, why don't you uh, try to wage peace? Why don't you try to organize for peace within the capital? Why don't you reach across the lines? Go play softball together, go, have a, go eat dinner together, go start talking together. And he said, why? Why bother? What's the point? What's going to happen? We don't agree on anything. So it's not about agreeing on things right now. That's really not where, where you're at in this stage in the conflict. Because when, you know, when I'm south of Jerusalem and, and sitting with a Palestinian and a, and a Jewish nonviolent leader and, and people ask them, hey, what's the political solution to this conflict? They say, that's step 10. Step 10 is the political solution. One state, two states, three states, who knows? That's step 10. Step one is being able to see your neighbor as a human being. And we're not at step one yet. And we need to start building these relationships in our community. I'm, I'm actually disappointed that not one person raised their hand as a registered Republican here. I, I know where we are, and I know that the vote here is, it's, this is not Philadelphia. There should be some Republicans in this room. We need to reach across the aisle. We need to build coalitions. We need to work together. We need to wage peace with the same scale, duration, and efficiency as we can wage war. And we can do it. And I want to make this point really clear here. In Harrisburg, when we're advocating for bills, our gift ban bill is a Republican bill. Our gerrymandering bill is a bipartisan bill. We live in a state with a Republican supermajority in the Senate and almost a supermajority in the House. We have a Democratic governor for now. We have to work across the aisle. We have to work across our differences. We have to build the beloved community that we want to see as we build it, right? We, we have to work toward it. So as I alluded to, last week I was in jail. Um, <laughs> not, the, not the first time, and it's a great place to build community, by the way. You're locked in a small cell with other people. There's nowhere to go. You can't look at your phone. You can't go out and get a bite to eat. There's really nothing to do but build community, tell stories, and 
not say anything so overt that the cameras are going to get you in trouble, but really just to have fun and, and build community. And I was there because uh, Marshawn Harrisburg is a participant in the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And so our, uh, last week, uh, the arrests and, and the actions and the rally were all around um, a few issues. Uh, voter suppression was one of them. Mass incarceration, immigration, Islamophobia, xenophobia, um, and indigenous rights were, were the rest of the rally. And all of these issues intersect, of course. And so we're in jail, um, and this is the, I forgot how many times I've been arrested. Uh, sixth time I think I've been arrested. Uh, third time in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And we do this not because it's fun, because it's really not, to be honest with you. Nobody wants to spend eight hours in a Dolphin County prison. Um, we don't do it because it's popular. Uh, we don't do it because people say nice things after you do it, because during it, people don't say nice things. Um, but we do it because we have to, because it's, it's, it's almost an obsession. It's, it's almost a controlled addiction in a sense. This idea of, of fighting for right. And the arrests are just one piece of it. It's the lobbying, it's the marching, it's the canvassing, it's, it's events like this. It's all part of the same idea. And it's this idea of, of biting into truth and not letting go. And of being zealous about it, of being almost fanatical about it. We need to wage peace. And the greatest wager of peace that I'm aware of in, in the world's history is, is Gandhi. Um, he was able to look at a situation where the greatest empire in the world at that point, by military might, owned their most economically rich colony. And after hundreds of years of occupation and colonization, they just left as friends, as friends. I mean, how do you, how do you top that? So Gandhi says, Gandhi has his, his word for this, his satyagraha. And satyagraha can be translated in any number of ways. It can be translated as, as a love force. Love force. And it's this idea that you're trying to evoke the love of those who you are protesting. You're trying to get a sympathetic response from them. You're trying to make it so that they love you. Not in the sense of, oh, I love you, here's a Valentine's Day card. But, oh, I love you, I can't let you be homeless. Oh, I love you, your children must be able to eat tonight. Because that's what real love is. It's obligation, it's responsibility, it's service. And we need to use that love force. Now, 2,000 years ago, Hillel was asked the question, what is the most important verse in the Bible? And his answer was, love your neighbor like you love yourself. And we need to start putting our neighbor above ourselves in a lot of cases and use that love force. Satyagraha can also mean a truth force. Truth force. As in you're, you're, you're using the truth as, as your, I don't even want to say tool, but it's, it's what you're putting forward, it's the truth. And we all have truths that we carry around with us that we need to fight for, that we need to put forward. Right? 1,800 years ago, the rabbi Ben Zoma was asked the question, what is the, most popular, what is the most key verse in all of the Bible? And he said, we are all created in the image of the divine, that that is the core truth, that we all have dignity, that every human being has dignity and that we need to use that force and amplify that force. And another definition, another translation of satyagraha is soul force, soul force. I believe it's what Dr. Martin Luther King was referring to when he called uh, the civil rights movement the marvelous new militancy of the soul. That there is something magical that happens when you put, when you have that human moment, when, when you put yourself in front of the powers that be, and you make them look at you as a human being with full dignity, there's a response, there's, a, there's an evoking of, of some sort of camaraderie, there's, there's some sort of spiritual connection that takes place in that moment. It's why during the Civil Rights Movement, all the uh, sit-in people, all, all the protesters were trained very, very thoroughly, and they were told, when you are being beaten by police, make eye contact. Because you're going to move them. You're going to move them. I'll tell you, I, I was in one protest, one arrest back in 2014, where I was booted from behind uh, during, during an action by a, a Homeland Security officer. And then I turned around and there was another one coming right at me with the taser in his hand. And we locked eyes. And he froze, and I froze. And then he moved in the other direction. I don't think I would have gotten that boot from behind if I was facing that way. Because there's something powerful about it. There's something powerful about that soul force. Rabbi Mordecai Kaplan was asked in the 1940s, what is the most important verse in the Bible? And he said, 
quoted the prophet uh, Zechariah uh, Zachariah from um, about 2,700 years ago, he said, not by might, not by power, but by soul alone shall we all live in peace. That we need to use the satyagraha, we need to use the soul force, this love force, this truth force, to write an equation that has been wronged in our time. The equation that might is over right. Because it's not by might, it's not by power. It's by goodness, it's by spirit, it's by soul that we're going to live in peace. And we need to elevate right over might once again, if we ever have. We need to work toward that. Now, Satyagraha, its most literal translation, is Satya means a, a, a truth, a, an absolute truth, an absolute truth, whatever that could mean. And Graha is very hard to translate, but it kind of means in a controlled addiction, an obsession, a, a, a tenacity, a, an unwillingness to let go. I, I, to me, it means you're, you see a car driving down the street and, and you see a bulldog run up to the car and, and jump at the back of the car and bite into the bumper and the car starts speeding away at 60 miles an hour and the bulldog just can't let go. That's what graha is. That's what it is. And that's what we need. We need dedicated citizen activists across the board. Whatever your absolute truth is, and I hope that it's democracy, I hope that it's the dignity of every human being being able to participate in the decisions that govern their lives, we need to dig in. We need to bite in. We need to organize for peace as well as we organize for war. We need to wage peace more effectively than we wage war. It's hard to overstate the story of our times, what we're living through right now. We're living through societal collapse and slow motion. We're living through chaos on, on every front and every issue. And it's not going to get better until we bust open the doors to the table and until we reclaim our seats at the table. And if we do, I mean, just think of the issues that you care about and how much of the public cares about them too. Most of the things we worry about are consensus issues. We do want to raise the minimum wage as a country. We do want to take on climate change. We do want to have common sense gun control. We do want to take care of workers. We do want to allow unions to exist. We do want all of these things, but we don't do it. And we need to reclaim our democracy so that we can take care of so many other issues. By way of introduction to the next speaker, we live in a Lester land right now. We live in a land where there are a small minority of people who make decisions that impact the majority of people. And that we need to take care of that problem first. We need to take care of this gateway issue, this key issue. And I think we will. And I want to end with, on a note of hope here, because we are moving in that direction. We are moving in the direction of taking care of these issues. We have seen so much progress in Harrisburg over the last year and a half. It's hard to believe. It really is. And we're moving and it's working and we need more support because we need to, we need to win over the long term. But this is a democracy movement, and I want to stress that point. Because there are so many groups working on these issues, and please join whichever one you are most comfortable with, and join six of them, join 10 of them, donate to eight of them, show up for three of them, respond on Facebook to 15 of them, because that's how everyone does it. <laughs> right now, we're living through a May Day period. We need to fulfill our American promise. We need to gather together and form some sort of wolf pack, of some kind, a wolf pack, you know? We need to march on Harrisburg. We need to make our government represent us. We need to guarantee fair districts. We need to find our common cause together. And I could go on and on and on. Those are all the names of democracy groups. And there are so, so many, and it's beautiful. Because we're living in an era right now where we are taking back our democracy. And we're not taking it back to what it was in 1963 or in 1863 or 1850, whatever. We're taking it to where it's never been before. Because that's where we need to go. So I'm very happy that you all came out to join us. I look forward to the Q&A session and to our next speaker, Professor Lawrence Lessig. So I'm incredibly honored to be on stage with these leaders. Um, well, there used to be two members of the <laughs> Uh, if you've not read Adam and uh, Frankie's book, Daring Democracy, it is an incredibly hopeful story 
about this movement that Michael has described, and the uh, extraordinary movement to, to rally people in this state to march on Harrisburg is an inspiration across the country. I know as someone who marched all the way from the top of New Hampshire to the bottom of New Hampshire in January, <laughs> fighting for these issues, that to see this type of engagement spread across the country is incredibly inspiring. Now when Peter invited me to come and speak at this group that was affiliated with Represent.us, I said, of course, yes, because the group, Represent.us, has done extraordinary work across this country to rally people at the local level to recognize the fight we must wage for democracy, which means a system that is not corrupt. And when he said it would be in Scranton, I said, of course, because I grew up uh, about 80 miles west of here in a little town called Williamsport. <laughs> and when I grew up, you guys were the city. <laughs> so Friday afternoon, we would come to the city. There was nothing to do, of course, but we would come to the city. And the idea that I would have a chance to come to the city and speak about these issues that have become so central to everything I do was irresistible. So I agreed to come. And I began to plan how I would come. And it turns out it's almost impossible to get here from Boston. Usually I think, you know, you just fly to a place like Scranton. But it was going to take at least five hours to fly to Scranton. And so my assistant said to me, you know, you could rent a car. You could rent a Tesla and drive to Scranton more quickly and more cheaply than you could fly to Scranton. And I said, what the hell? <laughs> and so I rented this car and drove here today. And I had one of these experiences which we in the democracy movement don't celebrate enough. And it was an experience recognizing, I'm begging the computer to recognize my presentation <laughs> here, but I seem to have been disconnected just at the last minute. It's plugged in. I think there's something. Can you change that this way? Back to what went before. This what is it before? Because what, yeah. Not the scale of the best for explain. Democracy is a slow process and it takes time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually good at tech. Okay. <laughs> is there a remote to hit like source? <laughs> That's for the analysis. Okay, so here's, here's the experience I had. That was a moment of recognizing how extraordinary this country is. Because we spend so much time in this movement talking about the terrible parts of America. But as I was driving this Tesla and recognizing, hey, wait a minute, this is an American car. Of course, it's a South African who moved to America, but that's America, an immigrant coming to America and getting something done, building this incredible car. I remember when I lived here, we were all feeling guilty. Could we buy foreign cars? You don't need to buy foreign cars eventually when it gets to the $35,000 version at least. You don't have to buy foreign cars. This is the greatness, a mountain in America. This weekend, I took my kids to see a movie. You know, out in Boston, they call it films. But I grew up here, so we call them movies. A movie, Solo, the early, early, first, really first of the series now, which is the Star Wars series. I remember in 1976, sitting in the Rialto Theater in Williamsburg, watching the first of those movies. But that movie was an inspiration as I sat there and I thought, this is extraordinary. Ordinary. This is what we do. We do this well. Imagine how complicated that brilliance is to pull together. If it weren't Boston, I would live in Nashville. The music of Nashville 
sings in my soul, it is the spirit of America, the greatness of the part of America that recognizes a kind of music the world doesn't quite get. But here's something about us we need to reflect on, not to deny how terrible things also are. We're a country that is tearing children from their mothers at the border. We're a country that still hasn't gotten over the consequences of slavery, which next year will have been 400 years old, 250 years before we ended it, and another 100 years before we delivered on the promise, and even today, still that promise has not been redeemed. There are many things we can be upset about, but what I think we need to do is to recognize that in this nation, too, there are things we should be proud of and ask, why can't every part of America inspire the way these parts do? In particular, I wanted to ask about our politicians. So, well, I mean, this is actually Ricky, but he does, and, uh, you know, he's not an American politician, but here he's playing one. But then I wanted to find an image of an American politician, so I went to Google and I did a politician's image, image search, and you know, it gave me some classic, you know, politician-like images. Here's a, even this, you know, stock photo says it can pay for this image. I didn't, but anyway. Um, <laughs> This image, like the classic image, but what was striking is in the Google image search for politicians, this image came up. <laughs> and this was our attitude expressed through the Google search engine about politicians. Or think about this institution, Congress. An institution whose confidence has collapsed so much that the current level of confidence in Congress is within the margin of error of the poll, it could be that it's at zero, zero level of confidence in Congress. And the question these facts should make us reflect on is why we can't be as proud of that institution as we are of country music? Why can't we celebrate the idea of democracy in America, which for much of our history we did, just like we celebrate the innovation in Silicon Valley. What is it that makes it that this core part of our contribution to humanity, this idea of a popularly elected republic, is now an embarrassment across the world? It's common to say that Americans are polarized, but what I like to focus on is the way that we actually are bipolar. <laughs> we are divided, no doubt, but we are also united. We are divided by party, tribes, separators, Republicans and Democrats, and in some places, none of the above, but we are united by a belief in a belief. We are united in a belief about our government. Extraordinary poll at the middle of 2016 about attitudes in America towards their government. This poll found the highest level of dissatisfaction ever in the history of polling about our government. But what was striking is that there was a common reason for this dissatisfaction. And the common reason to riff off the name of the organization that sponsored this event is they don't represent us. One poll said corporations and their lobbyists have too much influence. 89% of Americans agreed with that. 89% of Republicans, 90% of Democrats. Elected officials think more about the interests of their campaign donors than the common good of the people. 89% of Americans, 92% of Republicans, 88% of Democrats. Big campaign donors have too much influence. 91% of voters, 90% of Republicans, 91% of Democrats. We united in this view that our government does not represent us, and there is no difference between Republicans and Democrats in that view. In this, we are one. And in that unity, we are right. In fact, they do not represent us. They do not represent us equally. Think about the ideal 
of an equal freedom to vote. Do we have across this country an equal freedom to vote? And the answer is obviously we do not. Techniques to suppress the vote across the United States in 2016 resulted in 16 million Americans being denied the ability to vote, according to Charles Stewart at MIT. 16 million who suffered an unequal opportunity to vote relative to the 140 million others who could vote. Or do we have an equal vote for president in the United States? And the answer is absolutely not. We have an unequal vote for president. Not so much because of the electoral college, but because of a system called winner take all in the electoral college. Where states say the winner of the popular vote in that state gets all of the electors in that state. And what that means is the presidential election happens in just 14 states in the United States. In 2016, 99% of spending was in these 14 states. 95% of the time of candidates was in these 14 states. What were they doing for the other 5% of the time? They were in New York and California raising money. This is the product of a system nowhere written into the Constitution. But what it produces is a president who cares about a part of America which is older and wider and whose industry is not the industry of the future, but the industry of the past. That's an unequal vote for president, which means 85 million Americans voted just to have their vote not matter. Or do we have an equal vote in the House, something very salient here in Pennsylvania? Obviously we don't, because of safe seat gerrymandering, where districts are crafted so that you guarantee the politician can pick the voters rather than the voters picking the politician. And what that means is that if you happen to be in the minority in your district, you know your representative has never any reason to care about you. A million people voted Republican in Massachusetts in 2016. Not a single representative in Massachusetts is a Republican. And what that means is the <coughs> only thing those Democrats care about is avoiding a challenge from an even more extreme Democrat. Just like the only thing Republicans in safe seat Republican districts care about is avoiding a challenge from an even more extreme Republican. And so the extremists have their voice, they have their power, but the ordinary American who happens not to live in a district where he or she is in the majority is not equal in this system, which means 89 million Americans had no reason to participate in the election of their representative because they know their representative could not care about that. But the obvious, the most grotesque, the most extreme example of this inequality is the way we fund our campaigns. We take it for granted in America that campaigns will be privately funded. Not in Maine, not in New York City, not in Connecticut, not in Arizona, not in Seattle, but in the rest of America, especially here in my home state, Pennsylvania. Members of Congress and candidates for Congress spend anywhere between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money. My students don't know what this is. You know. <laughs> Dialing for dollars. <laughs> Calling people from across the country to raise the money they need to get back into power. Calling no more than 100,000 Americans to raise that money, meaning those 100,000 Americans have extraordinary power inside this political system, and the 139.9 million Americans who are not being called, not so much power. That 139.9 million have less power than this tiny, tiny fraction, even that's, I'd have to cut off four-fifths of one person in that graph to get it down to the inequality this system produces. The point is, add all these things together, and the reality is as obvious as it could be, they don't represent us because we are not equal citizens in this democracy. And that inequality matters. There's a study by Princeton political scientist, which is a Harvard professor, I'd like to put off the stage as quickly as I can, but Martin <laughs> Gillings and Ben Page conducted the largest empirical study of the actual decisions of our government in the history of political science. <laughs> Relating those decisions to the attitudes of the economic elite those people who fund campaigns, organized interest groups, the special interests in Washington, the lobbyists, and the average voter. 
And what they found with the economic elite is what you expect. The higher the percentage of the economic elite who support something, the more likely it is that that thing was actually enacted. Same thing with organized interest groups. The more likely, the, more, the higher the probability of uh, support by organized interest groups, the higher the probability that actually would be enacted. This is the way democracy is supposed to work. The more who support something, the higher the chance is that it gets passed. Here's the picture of the average voter. Yep. It's a flat line, figuratively and literally. What that's saying is, it doesn't matter the percentage of the average voter who supports something. It doesn't change the probability of that policy actually being enacted. As they put it, when they put it in English, when the preferences of the economic elites and the stands of organized interest groups are controlled for, the preferences of the average American appear to have a minuscule, near zero, statistically non-significant impact on public policy in a democracy. The views of the average voter do not matter. Now, when I went to public school here in Pennsylvania, this was the image we were taught of our democracy. There we are, we the people, driving the bus. But here's the reality of our democracy. The steering wheel has become removed from this bus because we've allowed this inequality to grow in our system, meaning we don't drive the bus. We don't control how this democracy moves. It's those who have this unequal power, this corruption of a republic. Now, the truth is, we get nothing until we fix this. Nothing. I don't care what your issue is. You might care it's finally time America addressed climate change. The 1% statistic is really astonishing. It's finally time, you would think, we address climate change. We will never pass climate change legislation until we address this corruption. You might think it's time that we build an economy that addresses the concerns of middle class workers again, so that the income of middle class workers can grow just like the income of the top 1% has grown. Last year, 87% of the wealth generated in America went to 1% of Americans. 87%. And that's not because they're geniuses. It's because they've got great lobbyists, an extraordinary work demonstrating it's because the government has changed its policies that this tiny fraction benefits so extraordinary relative to the rest of us. That will never change until we address this corruption. You want to talk about single-payer health care? It is a joke in a system where insurance companies and pharmaceutical companies and doctors fund campaigns. You want to talk about free college? Just cannot happen in a world where the only thing our government can do is to pass a $1.6 trillion tax cut. A tax cut paid for just by my children. Nothing we care about, nothing on the right or the left is going to happen until we get a government that represents us. This has got to be our fight. So how? Well, that question has two senses. How, as in what changes would it take? And I look at each of these four areas, and I guarantee you, votes of legislatures, not constitutional amendments, votes of legislatures could fix each of those four problems. It is completely within our democratic grasp, small d democratic grasp to address each of those problems and to give us a democracy that represents us. What the solutions are is not what I want to focus on here. What I want to focus on is how do we bring it about? What would it take? And here's where I really want to build off of what both of our previous speakers have said, but especially what Michael was saying at the end. We have got to stop playing normal in this way. Meaning we have to stop pretending that we just have to pick the right side and get them to do the right thing. 
Look, I'm a Democrat. I mean, I was a Republican when I lived here. I was the youngest member of a Republican delegation to the 1980 Republican Convention. I grew up, but I, I know what the right believes, because my dad teaches me that every single day of my life. <laughs> But the idea that we win this by just picking one party and pretending that partisan politics gets us a reform of a corrupted partisan system is ridiculous. It is not enough to put faith in the Democratic Party. They will not deliver on fundamental reform of the system. And even more, they will not inspire every American to step up and fight for a fundamentally reformed democracy because most Americans look at the political system and have no patience for the corruption they see. We have got to stop imagining we will elect our superman or superwoman <clears throat> who's going to go to Washington and solve all this for us. Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, or I don't care, pick your billionaire, because of course there'll be about 10 running in 20, 2020 for president. The idea that any of these people in a political party framed as a Democrat or even a Republican drain the swamp is going to fix the system is just silly. And what we have to begin to practice is a response to the politicians when they come to us and pretend that partisan politics is enough. It's a response a little bit like this. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to listen to this. I want you to stop telling me how the Democrats are going to save America. I mean, I know how I'm going to vote, but that's not the point. The point is we have to elevate this conversation above the partisan divide and begin to unite Americans as Americans around this issue. <laughs> We, all of us, must fix this. All of us. Whether it's from the left who made this issue central or from the right who made this issue central, whether you believe him or not. Because whether we succeed in this fight will depend upon the frame of this fight. If that frame is partisan, we lose. And as much as I admire the extraordinary efforts in, for example, the resistance movement, what I fear is that when that's the way it's understood, then our power dissolves. Because our power as partisans is tiny. They've divided us. It's our power as Americans that gives us the capacity to take on the most powerful interests in America and to win. All of us must do that. Now, it's about a decade ago when Barack Obama started a certain rhetoric in his campaign against Hillary Clinton to become the Democratic nominee for president. He told us we had to, quote, <coughs> take up that fight. He said, if we're not willing to take up that fight, by which he meant the fight to change the way Washington works, if we're not willing to take up that fight, Barack Obama told us, then real change, change that will make a lasting difference in the lives of ordinary Americans will keep getting blocked by the defenders of the status quo. We have to take up that fight. Because real change, making a lasting difference, will be blocked by the defenders of the status quo. Now, I'm an admirer of the former president. I think more people are today than were when he stepped away from the presidency. But the truth is, we should acknowledge he never took up that fight. Mm -hmm. right. He didn't introduce a single piece of legislation to address the corrupted way we fund congressional campaigns. And when he gave up presidential public funding, the first person since Richard Nixon, to be elected without presidential public funding, he promised the first thing he would do when he was in office was to introduce presidential public funding, never brought that bill to Congress. He did not take up that fight because he was convinced he got to Washington and the partisan Democrats would give him everything he needed. And they gave him a lot. And everything they gave him has been taken away 
by this partisan Republican administration. He did not take up that fight. But we must. We must not as Democrats. We must not as Republicans. We must as Americans. We have to build the movement to fix this first. As Americans first. Now, sitting in the front here, there was a young man who had a wonderful t-shirt on, and now he's gone. His t-shirt is one I wanted to take from him, to buy it from him, give him a ride in a Tesla for it. Um, <laughs> country over party. All of you have Republican friends. I think we have a Republican friend in the back. He has a Trump shirt on. Welcome. All of you have Republican friends. And every one of those Republican friends, if you don't talk about how much you hate the president, but you talk about how much you love America, if you don't convince them that you just want to tear down what America has built, but you want to celebrate the best and you want to make our government part of that best again, if you convince them that you are more than a partisan hack, you connect to them as Americans. That's what we have to find the strength to do. It is the hardest conversation. It's the most difficult struggle. But the inspiration is there. Benjamin Barber started his Moral Monday movement by taking African Americans and marching them into neighborhoods and sitting them at the kitchen counters of men whose fathers were in the KKK. And the question they asked was, what do we really disagree about? And the product of that engagement was a recognition that it's not Democrats versus Republicans. It's an ideal of equality in America against a corruption of that ideal that is America's democracy. We have enormous opportunity because America is already with us. We are with America. We are united in this view. And now we just have to find the discipline to show the respect necessary to inspire everyone to stand up and say, finally, this is ours, this democracy. And we're going to take it and run it as if it really were ours. Thank you for what you are doing. And please join in this movement as Americans first. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to have, this is a wireless mic, which is a great thing. I can get it off of here. OK. <clears throat> Gemma's going to be walking. Just speak up. Okay. <laughs> she has a shirt yeah. on. Hi. Uh, Mike Myers, my name. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for coming out. Um, the question I had for the panel is it's a legislative strategy question. Very exciting. Um, <laughs> Instead of passing piecemeal reform bills, why not push comprehensive anti-corruption legislation and force politicians to face the voters and their true views in 2018? Well, you're asking if in Pennsylvania. I mean, yes. I, I noticed you had uh, you mentioned how you had a gift ban bill and this bill, and. It seems to me that it really plays in the, the hands of the sitting politicians to not have to face votes on a comprehensive bill. Like they can say like, oh, I supported the gift ban bill and then they can vote against the gerrymandering bill. And it kind of undermines the reform movement if we separate it all out. And if you've made significant progress in passing the bills, I'd, I'd love to hear it, thanks. Absolutely. So, so first, kind of the progress we've had with individual bills. Um, the gerrymandering bill is about to be voted on in the Senate next week. We've already talked about how it's not ideal, um, but that is progress. And uh, next up on the Senate's agenda is the gift ban. So we're, we're making progress there. In the House, we have 
reshaped the house, I guess you could say. We've changed the culture there to a good bit that that's very encouraging into the future, for sure. So we, we are having progress with individual bills. Um, and, and keep in mind, in Harrisburg, that conventional wisdom is it takes six years to pass a bill. And so we've gotten this gerrymandering thing through. We're doing OK. Uh, the reason why to not do a total package of bills in, in Pennsylvania is that, um, for one, it's very, very hard, <laughs> simply put. To get politicians to sign on to a package of bills is much harder than doing it piecemeal. And one of the reasons for that is that not every politician who is with us on one section of reform is going to be with us on another section of reform. And so we need to build the coalitions be behind every single piece of reform. For example, uh, Martina White is the, the only Repu one of two Republican uh, state reps in Philadelphia. She is absolutely in favor of automatic voter registration. Her party is totally against it. Her leadership tells her, don't, don't support this. And she supports it because she has a, a Russian immigrant community in her district, and she wants them to vote for her. It's pretty straightforward. We have, with the gift ban, we have Democrats who are the sponsors of automatic voter registration who will not support the gift ban at all. So we need to kind of mold these coalitions, and, and they shift, and they, they need to take their own shape as we go. I'll also just quickly add that you know these reforms are additive, right? I mean, so if we pass the gift ban, it's going to be significantly easier to fight back against you know these special interest forces moving forward to try and get public financing. I mean, in an ideal world, you know, we pass all the reforms in one year and have a functioning democracy in the Commonwealth. But obviously, uh, that's very very difficult right now. I mean, the fact, that, the simple fact that we can't get a gift ban through, <laughs> get a gift ban. I mean, again, going back to quid pro quo corruption, that right. is the biggest example of quid pro quo corruption I can think of is literally giving a gift of a car. I mean, there's numerous examples of giving uh, someone a check for $11,000, buying a car, a vacation. I mean, that's bribery. That is legalized bribery. The fact that we cannot even outlaw bribery speaks to how difficult it is to move anything through the legislature. Well, you know, not to debate with you guys too much, but the Martina White is in a very democratic district. She won in a special election. There was an independent third party candidate. So she's kind of playing very defensive. Now, I assume, you know, it might be an easier lift if, a, like, for example, in Virginia yesterday, they just passed the Medicaid expansion. So 400,000 more Virginians are going to get health care. And the reason that happened is because the, you know, I hate to be a partisan, but the Republican Party lost 16 seats. They got smashed, and they lost the governor's race. And so that bill was brought up, and suddenly there's a lot more Republican votes for it because it was clearly going to pass. And so 400,000, you know, and for every 1,000 people that don't have health care, one of them die per year. So do the math. 4,000 Virginians died per year due to not having Medicaid. And so all I'm saying is if politicians are not forced to face the music, and I hear what you're saying, and I'm 100% I'm support your efforts. It's just we've got to get people on the record. And listen, if they don't want to vote automatic voter registration, they should have to face the music, and their voters will hopefully reject them. And that's just the way I look at it. And, and I obviously support you guys. And I don't, you know, you're on the field. I know how hard it is to fight. I fight on these issues, too. But I feel like we have this one-in-a-lifetime moment where people really are standing up and resisting. And if we keep our sights low and, and our goals small, we're going to get small victories. Yeah, and I'd, so I'd like to add. add to sorry. <laughs> you know, sorry for ranting. <laughs> we, we, we've worked together. Mm -hmm. And we've all been in Harrisburg. And um, some of the members that represent Northeast of Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania and Lancaster County, we've all been down in Harrisburg and in legislators' offices. And we've all been told, oh, I have to do it piece by piece, by piece by piece. Who's telling us that we have to do it piece by piece by piece by piece? The politicians, right, right. Mm -hmm. the elected officials, they're the ones who are telling us that this has to be done this way. We were convinced. And we slowly become unconvinced. I think. We're kind of looking at it as an organization, represent Pennsylvania. As an organization, we're now looking at it, well, we can do it piecemeal, and we can promote it all at once. 
So one of the things that we do in our chapters around the state, um, the initial sort of qualifier for a, a county chapter is to go to your local government and get a resolution in support of anti-corruption legislation. It's a general acknowledgement by a local government that they stand for getting rid of corruption. We sometimes get resistance, we sometimes have no resistance at all, we do some lobbying for it, we, you know, some places just, hey, yeah, that's, that's kind of duh. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the fact that we have the politicians telling us we have to do it in a piecemeal way is throwing us off course. So what we'd like to do, and what we are doing as an organization, is drafting, based on the American Anti-Corruption Act, a Pennsylvania Anti-Corruption Act. And we'd like people to participate in the drafting of that, so that we can go to the public and we can say, we have an Anti-Corruption Act for Pennsylvania, and it's comprehensive. Do we think it'll be passed all at once? Probably not. But it brings the issues, all of them, to the fore in one package. So we can work on this. We have to work on this from multiple angles. And we have to work on this in coalitions. There are a lot of people, like we, we've all talked about it, we built an incredible movement within this state, around gerrymandering especially. And we're at a point now where that is, um, it's in jeopardy, I have to say, because of what has been done at the state capitol to that bill. But it ain't over. Now is not the time to take our ball and go home. Now is the time for us to pull together even tighter to get what we want. Okay, so that's, that's where we'd like to go. Uh, I'm Tom Ulrich from uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and I was going to ask what is a one-sentence statement about what kind of democracy we want, but I thought I'd rather I'd, I'll just put one out there. Uh, I think we need to keep talking about what is, what do we want? We don't want this corruption. We want a representative democracy with economic, environmental, and social justice for all. I think most Pennsylvanians and most Americans would agree with that. And then we can say, but we don't have it, here's how we have to get there. I'd like your reaction. Well, I, I, I obviously agree that focusing on the way we've been denied a representative democracy is key. You know, people on the right like to say, we don't have democracy in America, we have a republic. Well, but the framers meant by a republic a quote, representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, they meant a democracy where at least the House, and now the Senate, because the Senate's also elected, um, would be, quote, as Madison put it, dependent on the people alone. And just to be clear, in Federalist 57, he said, by the people, I mean, quote, not the rich more than the poor. So they created a system that was meant to be directly dependent on ordinary Americans. And that would produce the representative democracy that would then deliberate on what public policy to adopt. And we've lost that exactly in the ways that I've described it. Now, I agree with you. We've got to say more than it's corrupted. We've got to say what it should be. And I just would only wonder whether we've got to say more than that. Because, of course, you know, I'm on the left. I'd love to talk about economic justice. I'd love, love to talk about environmental issues. But I don't want to say, I don't want that part of the sentence to take people who are not interested in those issues and make them feel like they're not invested in a representative democracy too. Because they are. All of us should be invested in a representative democracy. Nobody should be defending a system where 100,000 Americans have extraordinary power over the rest of us. Um, and if we can find the common ground that respects the other side as citizens and builds on that common respect, we get the system where we can have a shot at fighting for the issues that you and I, I think, care about. So that's, that's my push. Now, you know, let's admit, 
Most people in the Democratic Party think I'm nuts when I say things like this. Hmm. Most of them hate the idea that I would say anything to suggest that we should not just be rallying behind the Democrats. It's a wonderful clip with Nancy Pelosi and John Stewart. And John Stewart, you know, says the system's corrupt, and Nancy says, no, 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 the system's not corrupt. No, there are corrupt people in the system, but the system's not corrupt. And John Stewart's like completely baffled that she could say that. She said, he says, of course it's corruption. No, 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 just elect more Democrats. It'll be a complete. <laughs> and the point is, as a Democrat, I kind of believe, you know, most Democrats are. But the reality is most Americans can't hear that. Mm -hmm. Most Americans laugh in exactly the way you laugh. Because most Americans think they're both a corrupted system. So I would defend my party, but I think we have to find a way of talking about this that doesn't exclude half of the Americans as the, and when you open the door. We have to find a discipline that embraces all of us as Americans and then talks about what's the system that America should have. And once we have that, then the politicians can respond to their masters, which would be yeah. us. <laughs> Professor Lessig, on that score, we have so much energy, we have so much priority, and we're limited within it. And I would view that the assignment of the people in this room as a first objective is to defeat Donald Trump in 2020. And isn't your program dissipating that energy in some way by discouraging the preeminence of that assignment, which would be the uh, recognition and the effort of all of us? Yeah, it is dissipating that effort. Absolutely. Because I think Donald Trump is a time-limited problem. Mm -hmm. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, I am as strong an opponent of the policies, quote, policies he's advancing as anybody. And of course, if he gets us into a war, recklessly using nuclear weapons, it is the end of America as we know. We become the Germany of the 21st century. So I don't, I don't, the Nazi Germany of the 21st yeah. century, in the sense that we are hated by the world. So I don't mean to minimize the threat, but what I do mean to emphasize is that to the extent we spend all of our efforts focused on a problem that will take care of itself, he will pass. And we have not built the infrastructure to address the problem that will not take care of itself, and in fact, entrenches itself. And in four years, where will we be? You know, and so, so I look at people like Tom Steyer spending all of his money in ads in New Hampshire. Wonder why. <laughs> building a movement to impeach the president. If they impeach the president, if 2018 becomes an election where the Democrats say we're going to impeach the president, if they impeach the president, let me tell you what happens in 2020. 10 times the number of Republicans show up in 2020 because they will be furious that they've been impeached their president. And so it's not that I agree with the president. It's not that I support the president. It's not that I believe the president is a good president. It's that I believe there's a more important problem we've got to build the movement to address. And that only gets addressed if we find a way to talk to Trump supporters and say, hey, you wanted to drain the swamp. I want to drain the swamp, too. Let's talk about how to drain the swamp. Who's going to do it? I don't want to call you a name that makes you not hear what I say. So you framed it precisely right. The short-term solution to defeat Donald Trump is not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the long-term solution of getting a democracy that represents America. And that is not achieved merely by rallying the Democrats to defeat the president. I want to follow up on that. Yeah, so yeah. Pick up on that. <laughs> if we don't fix our democracy, my generation is not going to show up to vote in 2020 because we don't believe we have anything to vote for. We see a broken system that produces suffering and chaos. And until we fix that system, why vote? And, and I know that that sounds cynical, but that's, that's the way people think. Yeah, but let me just add to that. This, you've got this Rock the Vote sign here. Yeah. Rock the Vote turned out the largest number of young voters to vote in 2008 for Barack Obama. 2010, a whole bunch of their new voters were not going to vote. Right. And they asked them why. And the number one reason they gave is, it turns out no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. Mm -hmm. 
So it's exactly right. It, you know, you can fight the short-term fight. I was out there fighting for Barack Obama as much as anybody. But the fact that he didn't take up the fight means we're back to square one. We're back to negative square 10. <coughs> it's worse than it was in 2008. John McCain, you know, as much as you might, that wouldn't have been the disaster that we have now. So I completely agree. And I'm sorry, I just want to... I, I was somebody who voted for Barack Obama in 2008 and did not vote in 2010. And then what happened in between was, because I was uh, volunteering with President Obama's campaign, the DNC brought me in as an intern and they put me in the fundraising department. And so I saw exactly what was happening that summer of 2009 when the Affordable Care Act was being written. I said, how about it? Said, yeah, I, I'd kind of like to add to this too. I, I, you know, the discussion about Trump is really a distraction. Um, personally, uh, he infuriates me at times, but I'd like to see him succeed because if he succeeds, we all succeed in some, in some form. It depends, you know, on the issue and not all of that thing, but like it or not, he's in the office. Um, and then, you know, related to that is now, uh, what we have to do is elect Democrats. What you have to do is elect Republicans. No, none of those, neither one of those choices is an answer. It's not an answer. And in Pennsylvania right now, and there's a list I've put together, you can grab one at the back table uh, as you go out. Um, I'll give you the exact numbers. Seven Senate seats in Pennsylvania right now are uncontested. There is no opposition. 82 House seats are uncontested. There's no opposition. There is an opportunity before August 1st for any one of you to go get your petitions and get them signed and get on the ballot in one of those districts. And the very least that you will do is possibly move the discussion in the direction you'd like to see it go. Do you have a strong chance of winning enough? That remains to be seen. But at least the conversation and the challenge will be there. None of these people in the State House should feel comfortable. None of them. Are these all Republican seats currently? No, the Republicans and Democrats, the preponderance of Democrats. Okay, so you make the decision. Look at the list. The districts are listed. The candidates are listed. If you like what they're doing, all well and good. If you don't, you have an opportunity to challenge that. So I want to quickly just hop in here quickly, and then I want to pose a question to Larry, and then I want to open it back up. <laughs> this is very important. The first thing I just want to say about Trump is when I preface my remarks that we got to this place where drain the swamp is appealing, the point there was to highlight that Donald Trump is not an anomaly. Mm -hmm. That 40 years of undermining our democracy opened the door to the outsider who proclaims to be the savior. You know, if I had, had had more time, I could have gone through the ways our democracy had been undermined, the way in which faith has been eroded, our system has been delegitimized. The next Donald Trump, if you are repulsed by him, might actually be competent. Right. Right. So we better fix this system now to dissipate the anger that erodes the trust in our democracy, or words are far worse. So that is why I think we have to focus on democracy, whether you like Trump or not, because I think it cuts across both parties. But I, I do want to ask Larry a question here, because I want to kind of push this discussion. When we find a way to talk about democracy, when we find kind of the base level, how do we integrate race into it? In a room full of pretty much all white people, and four white people, four white men here on the panel, how do we find that base level that can cut across the party line while also acknowledging that people of color are being killed in the streets? Yeah, well, um, I find the inspiration for this movement 
for citizen equality, in the movement for racial equality. And I think the story to tell is the story of the fight for dignity that African Americans waged to be granted the most basic commitment of a free society. You know, and, and you know, I find even my students have no clue about how long it was in the history of America before there was even the vision of a fair shot. And not that we even are there now, but the point is, until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the open refusal of unions or government contractors to even employ African Americans was acknowledged and accepted and resisted um, uh, only small, in small ways by the rest of America. But the point is, that fight for equality, when you tell that story, gets people to recognize how incredibly important it is to, is to, is to fight for this basic promise of a representative democracy. And then get them to see that, in a certain sense, African Americans had an advantage. Because there was never a moment in the history of the fight for civil rights where African Americans were confused <laughs> about whether the system was treating them equally or not. Yeah. Like every day, you could wake up as an African American, no, you had something to fight for. There was a reason to be out there to fight. What's so striking about the equality, the inequality I'm talking about, is it's invisible to most of the people who are suffering from it. It's like the carbon monoxide of a democracy. Silent poison that kills the democracy. And especially among us white men, you know, especially us white men over the age of 50, who can't imagine a society where you know, we aren't on the top. <laughs> like To get them to recognize that, hey, look, in fact, this political system deals you an unfair card systematically all the time. You are disenfranchised. Is to begin to get people to recognize it's not us versus them, it's us. It's all of us that we have to be able to unite together in this kind of fight. So I completely agree. We have to learn from our brothers and sisters who have fought for equality across the history of America. Women who fought for the right to vote in the first part of the last century, um, and then fought for an equal rights amendment that, of course, was stopped. And African Americans who fought for equality, too. That fight continues and obviously has so much more to deliver on. But we all should be fighting for this equality. That, that is the principle that has convinced me unites us rather than divides us. Uh, first of all, thank you all. This is very, very inspiring. Um, I got involved in um, the political world about two years ago as I saw the political campaign in 2016 starting to uh, go off the rails and I decided to actually look and see what I thought about the various political parties since the two major parties weren't really representing me. Um, and I, I became involved in the Green Party. I think um, some folks know that here. The question I have is when, I'm wondering what you think about ranked choice voting. Um, because what I find is that even in the election of 2016, I was afraid to vote Green Party. It was like, uh, can I do that? And, um, and right now, you know, not to self-promote, but I'm running for office right now, and I find on the Green Party, and I find speaking with Democrats, Republicans, all kinds of people, they don't, you know, it's like Green Party, go away, you're, you're the spoilers, you're messing things up, and it, it, it doesn't it doesn't even enter in the conversation that there is a Green Party. You know, a lot of people don't even know what it is, or Libertarian, or, or you name it, any of the minor parties. So I'm just wondering if you have, you know, Put that into your uh, thought process. Well, so one of the projects that Equal Citizens um, uh, is gearing up to launch is an effort to introduce ranked choice voting in a couple key states for president only. And, th and the theory behind it is um, most people don't understand what it's about. They don't understand how it works. And if you imagine changing the whole system from the bottom up, which Maine has just done, uh, or Chai is trying to do, um, it just is too confusing for people. They don't see really what the return is or what the benefit is. But if we could give them a clear example, the presidency, where arguably three of the last four presidents were elected because of third party candidates, 
Um, then they can begin to see why it actually could help. And in this next election, it was a particularly strong moment to try to move that, because I'm sure the president would love to have a system so that the challengers to the president um, can have their say, but not necessarily take away Republican votes. And the Democrats, who have lost two of the three, should like a ranked choice voting system. Because you can vote for Jill Stein and then vote for Hillary Clinton. It's hard for her to utter the words, it's better to have Donald Trump as president than Hillary Clinton, but that she had to do because of exactly this problem. And it would be better for third party candidates because third party candidates could say, look, give me your first vote. And if I don't get enough, okay, fine, I won't take away what you want um, because you'll have your second vote. And I think if we could move it in a couple key states, and Pennsylvania would be a really great one to move it in, um, then others would copy very quickly. And if you had a general movement at the level of the president for ranked choice voting, it becomes easier to imagine moving it than down the stack to the legislature, uh, to Congress, and also to the, to the state legislature. The ranked choice voting is the simplest way to solve the problem of gerrymandering. In a great group called Fair Vote in Washington has a plan to basically create multi-member districts for Congress with ranked choice voting. So then the districts don't matter so much. And if you have like five congressmen in ranked choice voting in a particular district, that means if you represent 20% of, of you in the district, you're going to get a representative. So this could solve the problem overnight. Congress has the power to do it under the Constitution. Um, and, but the, I think the biggest challenge is people just don't understand it well enough to understand why it's a, an important solution. So do you get rid of primaries in that case, or no? <laughs> That's a real problem in California, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't care. I well, it's a separate question. Yeah, so it is so, separate so question. at the moment, you would still have a primary, and then you would have right choice. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. You know, I'm, I'm a like, in my introductory remarks, I told everyone that I'm a member of the board the elections board in, in Luzerne County. And there, it was, it's an interesting thing. Um, just to give you kind of an example of how entrenched the parties are in how our, our governments work, even at this, at this level. I have to be registered as a Democrat or a Republican in order to serve on the board. So I'm a Democrat. I've always been a Democrat. This last election cycle, I was really on the fence. And the paperwork was all filled out to declare myself as an independent. And then I read the county charter, which said you can't serve on the elections board if you're an independent. That's how entrenched it is. Another thing, and this is kind of a practical matter, and you can't do one without the other on these things. We talked about we talked about getting rid of primaries, and we we've, we've chatted about that versus open primaries. Um, in Luzerne County, and I'm sure it's a similar situation in, in Lackawanna County and, and the various counties where we all live. It costs us about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars of property tax money to put on an election. Now coming through a primary in a state where there's closed primaries means that all of the taxpayers pay for a function of a political party without being able to participate in that. So there's two solutions. There's open primaries. There's semi-open. Well, that's semi-open, so that's a, that's a second one. And then there's, you know, just get rid of them. It's a party function. Let the parties choose their own people, and don't put it on the well, don't put that burden on the taxpayer. But you cannot do that without leveling the playing field for third-party candidates and independent candidates. Because currently in in this state, if you're a Democrat or a Republican. You can raise a few signatures and get on the ballot. If you're a third party, it's only because of recent court cases that third parties have some level of equality in access to the ballot. Some of them. It's better than it was, but it's not as good as it should be. 
And as an independent, you're still um, subject to what's called the 2% rule, where you have to go find out how many votes were cast in the district for which you are running, and you have to get 2% of the signature, 2% of that amount in order to qualify to go up to the ballot. I think when, when <coughs> you know, okay. yeah, okay. you know Carl Romanelli, of course, in the Green Party, and he ran for Senate and was the subject of some of these court cases, uh, along with some others, in 2006. His requirement to run for Senate was 67,400 signatures. How many signatures does a Democrat have to get or a Republican? What's the number? 5,000? 2,000. 2,000. He raised 100,000, was challenged by one of our current senators, won the challenge, and then was charged back $84,000 for the legal fees incurred by that senator's um, legal team. So he was on the hook for losing a case. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that has recently been changed. He does, he's not on the hook for that. He fought that and he won. But the point is, there is not equal access even to the ballot. Not just the election, but to the ballot. And we are so entrenched in this two-party system that sometimes we just can't even see beyond it. And George Washington warned us of exactly what's happening now in this country with the parties. So we really have to start thinking differently about how, how we elect people. And do you want to be in that private club? Okay. John? Peter, thank you for uh, inviting me tonight. Uh, it sounds like a lot of you traveled quite a ways. I heard somebody from Bethlehem area. Uh, we have some of our panel up there. Thank you for traveling here too, by the way. Uh, I'm John Kistler. I live locally here in uh, Northeast Pennsylvania. I run an internet radio show. Peter's done a couple of shows with me. And, you know, I, I hear this word democracy. Oh, by the way, I think I am the only registered Republican in the room today. Yeah, you are, John. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not afraid I face tougher audiences. Uh, but anyway, you know, we, I, I hear them throwing out this word democracy. And uh, we're not a democracy. We're a republic. Remember the Pledge of Allegiance and to the republic for which it stands. You know, this party line thing has to go. Last, uh, the last election, I was one of the poll watchers for my district and Sid Michaels was my state representative. And he came over to me because I was adamantly opposed to Sid running on the ballot because he was saying that he was in support of this property tax reform, Senate Bill and House Bill 76. Anybody heard of that? Yes. Okay. If you've noticed, the Senate Bill and House Bill 76 is a political football. He came over and he attacked me, said, I'm bad mouthing him. And I said, well, wait a minute, Sid, hold on a second. I said, will you folks come over here and listen to this? I said, Sid, you're a, you're a supporter of this Senate Bill and House Bill 76. You're, a, you're actually a co-sponsor, right? I said, do you ever plan on letting it come to see the light of day? I said, well, but, but I'm a co-sponsor. I said, are you going to let it see the light of day? Because the truth is you are not. It's just to get votes, right? He ran. <laughs> Don't be fooled by this rhetoric that they come out, this kind of crap that they're going to give us justice. We own this country. You know, on my radio show, I always say, folks, this is not the me show. I am not doing this for me. I'm doing it for my children and my grandchildren, but I'm also doing it for your children and your grandchildren because our parents and our grandparents didn't get up and do what they should have done because my parents came here from Italy and from Poland. Okay? They were happy to be in America where they thought that they were free. And let me tell you folks, freedom in this country is only an illusion. It's only an illusion right now. If you think you're free, don't pay your taxes. Don't pay your property taxes. 
okay? Because it's all about the money. That's all they want. They don't care about you. They have their special interest groups that keep putting big piles of money into their campaigns year after year after year to get them reelected. We have a real simple solution to this. Just vote the bums out. <laughs> do this four terms. Four terms. If it's a two-year term, do it for eight years. If it's a four-year term, do it twice. Okay? Just vote them out. Get rid of all the cronies that are in office right now. That's all we have to do to change this. Because you've got to drain this swamp one way or another. And how are you going to do it? you got to get rid of the fish that are stinking up the barrel, folks. <laughs> that's all we have to do. Yeah. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thanks, Josh. Thanks, John. And I'll remind people again, 89 House seats unopposed. Seven Senate seats unopposed. So, I mean, what's striking about what you said is I think there's only one thing I'm going to disagree with. And that's where you started, but let's put that to the side. Because, because what's angering you, I think is what's angering many of us. You know, you say this is a system where it's the money that's driving the special interests to get the things for them. They take away our freedoms. I'm with you, 100% with you on that. And the question is, what should we do about it? And you say we should throw them out. I'm all for throwing them out. But if you don't change the system, the same kind of people are going to come back in. When I started doing this work in 2008, my uh, congressman died. And um, people said, I should run for Congress. If I want to reform Congress, go to Congress. So Joe Trippi, who ran Howard Dean's campaign, flew in. And he said, I'll run your campaign. And he said, uh, you've got to make me just one promise. And I said, okay, what's the promise? Said, you're going to promise me that between today and the day you announce your retirement from politics, you will spend two to four hours on the phone calling people to raise money. <laughs> I said, Joe, no, no, I can send emails. He said, no, you can't send emails. <laughs> the subtle dance that goes on those conversations only happens on the telephone. And you've got to spend two to four hours every day, seven days a week, between now and the day you retire. And I said, Joe, this makes this very easy. There's no way I could do that. <laughs> but then it made me think, who are the people who can do that? What are those people like? Because the system is filtering for a kind of person who's a professional at sucking up to powerful people. That's what he does, mainly he does well. And when you say, does that system produce leaders, is it any surprise? <laughs> <laughs> that it doesn't produce leaders? It produces people who know how to triangulate on what money wants. And so money gets what it wants. Now, I'm all with you, throw the buns out. But then let's change the system so that the new people who come in can at least try to work on representing the people who sent them there. Which is why I like the Seattle program that says give everybody a $50 voucher. Mm -hmm. Which is an idea that you know, people on the right have pushed as well. Give everybody a $50 voucher. The first $50 of the money you send to Washington comes back to you. And every American, you know, I'm talking about income tax, I'm talking about all the different taxes we pay, every American sends at least $50 to Washington. The first $50 you send comes back to you in the form of a voucher. You use that to fund political campaigns. If the politicians were worried about raising money from the tens of thousands as opposed to the hundreds, <laughs> The tens of thousands would have power. He who pays the piper calls the tune. So let's make it so we pay the piper. And then they'll follow the tunes that we call. So, so this is the place that I think we should have the opportunity to find some common ground. And then I'm just going to invoke my law professor status here for a minute. Um, <laughs> you're right. We are a republic. My book's called Republic Lost. Um, but I'll give you a thousand sites where they tell us what a republic was. And in their mind, a republic was a, quote, representative democracy, end quote. So it's not a direct democracy. And I'm all against direct democracy. I think it's a terrible idea. It's a representative democracy. But as a representative democracy, they never had in their mind it should be representing 50,000 Americans. <laughs> they had in their mind it should be representing the people. Not the rich more than the poor, Madison's words. Not the rich more than the poor. So let's embrace the republic rhetoric. 
sell more books. Republic, yes. <laughs> it's a republic, which means it's a representative democracy, which means it's got to be a democracy that represents us equally, and it doesn't right now because the money is corrupting the system, and the only way to change the system is throw the bums out and change it so the new people coming in are free to lead. You, you were talking about the Electoral College may be okay, except it's a take-all that is the evil. And I'm sure you're aware of a proposal now when several states approved, whereby yep. in those states, the popular votes yep. would receive the electoral votes, so that as a result, you would have a popular vote succeeding through the electoral college. And it has a requirement that it must have 207 yep. of the states. Now, I think there are 160 electoral votes. 172. 172. What's the prospect? <laughs> and how do you get about accomplishing that? Well, so, um, yes, this is called the National Popular Vote Project, which um, I support and equal citizen support, although we're doing different work. What we're doing is we're trying to, we're, we've gone to court, we've sued four states, and we've said, um, this winner take all violates one person, one vote. If you're a Republican in Massachusetts or a Republican in California, you don't matter. You will never matter. Uh, if you're a Democrat in Texas, you're a Democrat in South Carolina, you don't matter. So we count the votes for the person of throwing it away, and that violates the principle of equality that the court has articulated many, many times, including in Bush versus Gore. But we think a simpler, more direct solution would be to get this national popular vote solution. So what stops it right now? Well, there's, a, there's 12 states, 172 electoral votes. They have to get to 270 electoral votes. There's a thick red line that's been drawn because the Republican Party believes that the only way they win the presidency is to have the current system. Mm -hmm. So we don't yet have a clearly Republican state following the lead here, even though in every one of the states that has passed, it's passed overwhelmingly bipartisan. So I think what's got to happen is there's got to be a couple critical Republican states that flip. And my favorite is my home. Mm -hmm. This state, yeah. this state followed. Yeah. That would be an extraordinary break in the dam. And if you could get it on the ballot in a bunch of other states, it would pass. And so that would be a way to fix this distortion in the existing system. And you know, the advantage you would get is you wouldn't have television commercials advertising presidential campaigns 24-7 for two years in a row, right? That would be spread out across the whole country. <laughs> Very quickly, there were two Republican states that were on the verge. They passed in one branch of the legislature, and then the 2016 election happened, and they immediately rescinded it. Uh, we were on the verge of having two Republican states. I don't want to give you them because I, I think it's Georgia and Arizona, but don't quote me on that, where it passed one branch or one by one house in, in, in the legislature. Um, but then it was revoked. There is also some questions about whether or not Congress would have to approve the interstate compact. Um, so there's some legal ambiguity there, but certainly if Pennsylvania were to pass it. But the purple wall, as you would call it, so the, there's the red wall of the conservative states and there's the purple wall, because ultimately, uh, because of winner take all, because we have swing states, the, the research shows that swing states, in other words, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, gets significantly more in federal grants than the rest of the country. Yeah, I think the number is about 7.5, or no, somewhere between five and 7% more federal grants than the rest of the country. So swing states do benefit, that's another big problem we can get through. Of course, I personally think that being bombarded 24 seven for two years in a row by uh, campaign ads is more than enough of a, a price to get rid of the <laughs> so then you're not going to have the media wanting to help out with this campaign because they want the money from the ads. So, you know, it cuts from both ways because right now you've got media like you know New Hampshire media is incredibly rich because they have such high price ads because they got all the presidential campaigns and they have it's a swing state for the Senate too because of various kinds of senators too. But if you had if you had basically national popular vote, media in Utah would get presidential ads. Media in Texas would get Democrats running presidential ads because on the margin, 
you as a presidential candidate is just looking for where you can get votes, and um, and that would be, happen all across the country. I want to, I want to sort of touch on uh, two points quickly. Uh, the first was was what you were saying about kind of why why don't we just vote them out, vote these votes out. Um, <coughs> And I just want to describe kind of what a day in the life of a Harrisburg legislator looks like as far as corruption goes. Because the pressures are real and, and they're intense. And I have admiration, deep admiration, for all those who are able to, to withstand them, um, because most people are, are not able. Politicians go to Harrisburg for the most part because they want to change the world and make a difference and do good things in their community. And they run for the right reasons. And then they get into office, or it's, it usually begins before they get into office. And here are the things that they're threatened with. A lobbyist will walk into their office and say, I see you have a re-election campaign in two years. How would you like $100,000 to help out with that? And if you say no, they'll say, I see you have a challenger running against you. I think I'm going to make a $1 million contribution to them, and we're going to drag your name through the mud for the next two years with the TAC ads. That's one way. Another way is if you want to vote against party leadership. Party leadership will come to your office and will say, I see that your district was gerrymandered for you last time. How would you like it to be gerrymandered against you next time? And everybody in the Capitol knows five legislators who have been drawn out of their districts. It happens very regularly. They can also come in and say, Jerry, if you don't support us on this, then the new jobs program that's planned for your district isn't going to happen. Right? There's so many le levers of power that have corruption baked into them that build a system where our legislators are incentivized to make bad decisions again and again and again. And it's, it's, it's tough. Um, and and you, you honestly, you feel for them when, when you're talking with them sometimes. For example, Representative Rapp, uh, he's, he's my representative down in Philadelphia. And he, uh, he told me this story when he was eight months on the job last summer. And he said, every single Saturday, I see the CFO of Comcast. <coughs> Kids play soccer together, we live in the same area, I see him every Saturday. And he goes, every single Saturday, I know I can go up to him and ask him for $100,000, and he'll give it to me. No questions asked, totally legal. But we would both know what that means. It means that the representative has an open door policy to Comcast for the rest of his career. Comcast, by the way, doesn't really pay taxes in our state. They, they really want to pay. And, uh, and he said, he goes, but if I did take that $100,000, what I could do with it is amazing. I could do what the Speaker of the House did, I could do what the Minority Leader did, what the Majority Leader did, what all the leadership did, which is take that big money, give 500 to that campaign, 2,000 to that campaign, and just spread the money around for a few cycles, buy yourself enough friends, and then he goes, I could be the Speaker of the House. And from there, who knows? U.S. Congress, U.S. Senate, I can retire as the Secretary of State for the United States of America. And he's not wrong, he's a talented guy, he probably could. And he goes, every single week, I see two, door, two roads in front of me. He said, I don't know how much longer I can go without taking that Comcast. <coughs> they all face these choices. I found that it takes about six months to two years for them to make the wrong choice. <laughs> so you see how important state politics is. <laughs> we can change the electoral college at the state level. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to make one more point. And then we'll get to Think back to the senatorial candidate or the senatorial race, the last senatorial race. That was the most expensive senatorial race in the history of the United States. Something close to $196 million was spent in that race. Less than half of that money for both candidates came from within the state. So you can make a really good case that no matter who won, they were going to be representing someone in Kansas or Texas more than they were rep representing the, the, the folks in their state. And I would like to kind of float an idea. I don't hear many people talking about it. You want to limit campaign contributions? If you're running for Senate, you can only take contributions from within your state. If you're running for Congress, Congress, you can only take contributions from within your district. And at the state level, the same way. Because it's down that. We, we're seeing that. We know people at the state level are really easy to buy. Cheap. Does not cost much. And it makes a huge difference. 
nationally and, and, and within our state and in our communities. Yeah, uh, this was not my question, but you said somebody within your, your district, you can only accept money from somebody within your district. Well, what if your district has been gerrymandered Republican? And so you're... You see, you see the complex of complexity of the system, but of course. I, you know. Anyway, that wasn't the question I wanted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the question, I, the thing that has bothered me, anybody who's ever watched Jay Leno, who's gone now, of course, but when he would go out on the streets and ask people simple, simple civics questions, they were at a loss. They had no clue what he was talking about. So this is a very big problem, the dumbing down of America. And I think, you know, it's fine for all of us who are politically aware to be getting into all this, all these movements, etc. but without the, the greater mass of the American people learning what's going on, I think we're just, I think it's hopeless. And how do we educate these people? Well, um, I think the first thing to recognize is they don't, for the most part, have a reason to get involved. Why would they? They don't give them money. They probably live in a gerrymandered district. Mm -hmm. They know that their voice isn't going to matter because the lobbyists are the ones that are controlling. They don't know any of this because they have no... But my Politics point, is off the radar for but them. My point, is the, my point is the reason it's off their radar is that, in fact, it doesn't pay for them to pay attention. If you tell them they ought to go out and vote, and they see that nothing happens when they vote, they say, I've got better things to do. You think of the mother who's got two jobs and you know three kids, and you tell her she needs to go out and get involved in politics, the first thing she's going to think is, in exchange for what? I mean, what am I giving up to do that, and what am I going to get from that? Now, I believe they ought to, but I think the best way to, to get them to is to give them a reason why it makes sense. And that means to change the system so, in fact, they are represented. And once they're represented, I'm happy to go out and say to them, you know, you're a schmuck. <laughs> you're a schmuck. But now, all I can say is you're a rational schmuck. <laughs> and I think that's the first, that's a really important thing. Can we, can we do, like, three questions in a row to try and get some more voices in, and then yeah, we can answer? Yeah, we have, have He's waiting a while back here. Yeah. Uh, my question is pretty simple, um, and it kind of piggybacks off what she said about raising people's consciousness. Uh, I spoke, uh, Rabbi Michael spoke in Lancaster the first time I met him. I was not aware of a gift ban. Um, I'm five years out of university, and I took some political science courses. Not once did they ever let us know that, that giving gifts to politicians was legal or gerrymandering or anything. Uh, we sit in a country now where you hear a lot about fake news. Uh, you see the Time Warner AT&T possible merger. You see Disney going after Fox and Comcast coming in. Uh, my question is simple. Where do you gentlemen source your information? What media sources are your guys' go-tos? So maybe all of us in this room can you know, go to those sources as well and then share that information with our friends, whether it be on social media, and you know, kind of plant that seed that hopefully will grow and blossom. Thank you. Excellent question. And I just want to jump in. First response. I, I do not trust any media source that is unwilling to ask the following question. Who is taking money from who to do what for him? That basic question is never asked on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, you name it. They don't ask it because there's inherent conflicts of interest. Same people who own MSNBC are the same people who make our fighter jets. Why are they going to ask a question about corruption in the military industrial complex? So that's first, I just want to acknowledge that, a absolutely. And second, um, I get my uh, information, I'm going to turn this over to Adam in a second, from a very young democracy scholar over here, who I've read two articles of his in the last week. I get my information from Professor Lawrence Lessig, um, from independent sources, from people who are not so incredibly beholden and interwoven into that corporate media structure. So when I was a kid, I, um, I went to the Soviet Union. I was obsessed with the Soviet Union, not in a pro-communist sense, but in a kind of pro-American sense. Um, I was followed, I was hitchhiking through the Soviet Union, kind of weird thing at the time. And uh, I was followed, wherever I went, there was always somebody who happened to speak English around me. So I was on a train from Leningrad to uh, Moscow, and this professor came to me and he said, you know, we have a better system of free speech in 
the Soviet Union than you do in America. And I said, what could that possibly be? He says, no, no, hear me out. You wake up every morning and you read the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and you think you know the truth. We know everybody is lying to us. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to read seven different sources and triangulate on the truth. And when I think about that, I begin to think that's kind of America today. Like people my age and older, they're used to the days where you could wake up and read the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and believe you knew the truth. But my kids, they think everybody is lying to them, <laughs> including me, but I'm not, but the rest of them are. <laughs> and the point is they develop this kind of Soviet skill to begin to balance one against the other. And, and we've got to encourage that. We're never going to go back to the place of Walter Cronkite. And that might be a good thing, because Walter Cronkite was great for a thousand things, but not for a whole bunch of other things, too. Like There was not much about class. There was not much about um, uh, uh, sexual equality, there was not much about, uh, not enough about race until it exploded. Um, um, but you know, we're not going to go back there. We've got to accept the reality of a world where there is no menu of the right things to listen to. And we've got to build a democratic understanding by just teaching people how to be critical and to ask, what else do I need to read to know whether this is true? Jay? Uh, yes, Jay Sweeney. Uh, I live in Falls Township, Wyoming County. Uh, and I am one, a candidate for one of those uh, races that Mike uh, or Peter was talking about, a, an unchallenged uh, uh, state senator. So if you live in the 20th district and Lisa Baker is your uh, representative, I will hope you will sign my petition before you leave tonight. <laughs> but I was moved by, I guess it was Mike over here, uh, comments which I agree wholeheartedly with. But the, the point about the republic of course, we live in a republic, but it's a democratic process where we use to select our uh, representatives. And um, many of you know, if you were at the primary this year, we had a very poor turnout. Uh, and, and as a third party candidate, uh, I can tell you the difficulty to just get on the ballot. And uh, uh, some of these things need to, uh, I think, uh, making it easier for third party and independents to get on the ballot might stimulate the process to bring people to the polls. Um, so it more, it's more a comment than a question, but, but uh, like I said, and, and Professor Lessig, you, you addressed uh, Mike's uh, comment about the Republic, but um, that was what moved me to speak. John. John. Uh, John. But thank you. Uh, Again, going back to uh, rank choice voting on that, it, that's a key, that's a key aspect of, of, of that ballot access. You can have ballot access, but you, you also have to have some form of ranked choice voting uh, in order to make that really reflective of the people's will. I just want to offer a quick word about how the two-party system functions. Um, you know, in the state, we've already talked a lot about it. Um, they function like a cartel in the sense that we have two-party rule that functions as one-party rule because they divide turf. And they have non-competition clauses that are not written down anywhere, but it's the way it functions. So in our last gerrymander in 2011, that would not have passed. That map would not have passed without Democratic support. That map got 36 Democratic votes in the State House to pass. And the only reason it did was because Harrisburg Republican leadership went to Congressman Bob Brady in Philly and said, how would you like a very safe district? He said, oh, sure thing. And it was that simple. It was this collusion to have the cartel set up. And it, it's, it's so entrenched. Um, another example, uh, Daryl Metcalf. Who here knows that name? Daryl Metcalf. <laughs> okay, good. They're arrested three times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's the obstruction of the House State Government Committee. He is the, uh, has been ranked the number one conservative in the state. Uh, the Democratic, when you talk with Democrats, they'll say he's our number one enemy in the state house. We want him gone. They don't actually want him gone. The minority leader's office made very clear to me last week, when we send out an email with Daryl Metcalf's name in it, we order it like crazy. We like that. He's a perfect foil for us. We get to point at him and go, look at that racist, give us money. They were not going to run anybody against him. I badgered the House Democratic Campaign Committee again and again across the street from the state capitol in Harrisburg this fall, because I would go and I would say, what's your strategy to knock out Daryl Metcalf? And they would say, we have a 203 district strategy. I say, great, who do you have running out in Butler County against Metcalf? I say, nobody. Mm -hmm. 
What are you talking about, 203 district strategy? I bugged them again and again, week after week after week, until they finally put me in contact with potential uh, candidates out there. And I won't say anymore for tax status reasons, but there is somebody running against him now. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think about mandatory voting? We live, in a, we live in a democracy, a democratic republic. We have freedoms. We have the freedom to choose not to choose. Yeah. We did abstain. Yeah, but we could just go there. Fine people. What if, you know, if you're forced to vote for a candidate you don't like, as, as many of us were in the last election, what good is it? Well, I Works think if I were put in that position, I would work hard not to have candidates that didn't want. Well, let me, let me ask it. Let me, let me throw something out here, too. How many of you, I know there's mostly been friends in the audience here. How many of you would have felt um, um, disturbed or, you know, uh, by the Democratic Party? Um, yeah. Isn't it almost as if they're being paid to lose? Yes. Yeah. And in reality, because of the way our financing system works, their donors are pulling the strings. So in fact, they are being paid to lose. Because that's how the power structure works now. But what we need more of us work? Compelled. If you're compelled to vote for somebody who is not, yes. oh wait, 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 does anyone else? So, so I actually, um, I'm sympathetic to the idea. I think I, I'm not sympathetic to the idea until we give them a reason to want to vote. Mm -hmm. So it's like a charade to say they've got to go vote in a gerrymandered system or a system where the candidates are really just caring about the money, not about that. So I, I'm not in favor of it here. But I do think that the consequence of it, you know, you see a little bit of this in Australia where there is mandatory voting, is that candidates know they can't get away <laughs> with certain things. Because certain people are going to show up who in our system don't show up. Like the people who get involved in our system are the politically active and they tend to be at the extremes. Um, so I, I, I think this could have a consequence that would be leavening and we could, you know, to go back to the the, um, the question of like raising the moral charge for citizens. This is one of the obligations of citizenship to participate. Right. So I think if I think if people were forced to vote in some way or really encouraged to vote, we get civics in our schools. We get people debating and talking about things that are important in our society and our community. Yeah. Where we're not getting that. And we, we could force them in the way that America forces people to do things. We could pay them. Right, right. So, we get a free coffee. As a 7 to 12 high school teacher, just certified, we don't teach civics anymore. Did you want to ask, ask, did you want to ask a question? Yes, I do. Yeah. Can, I, can I very quickly just give one quick? I just want to say that regardless of where you stand on mandatory voting, we need to do a much better job of pushing the boundaries. We're actually literally just having this conversation in the car right up here. There are so many things that are even on the table that we should be talking about just to expand the conversation of how to push our democracy forward. Forcing voting is, a, let's, that's a bad way to put it. Mandatory voting, I think, is better because you can cast a blank ballot in Australia, and even they still get 80, 90 percent. But you know, universal voting, lowering the voting age, these are things that we should at least be talking about. I'm not saying we have to support them, but we can expand our democratic toolbox. And I think that's why I like that question. One of the best ideas you threw out, sorry, in the car, was why not have dinner at the polling place? <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty simple. Well, I want to ask the audience a question first and then turn it to you. How many of you ever go to your local municipality meetings or go to a school board meeting? Okay. Do you go regularly or just when there's a hot issue? But most of you not. Okay. Well, why I ask that question and I'm going to turn it to you is that one of the things that um, I do, like I'm working finishing up my master's degree in education for at-risk students and I teach at a school where I work with at-risk students and I'm working on a book here in the coal region about cold country churches and how its impact on poverty in the area. And there's actually an article a couple of weeks ago that is listed Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Hazleton area 
as number 13 in the country as a region that's been hit hard by poverty that is not growing. Um, you know, even though the gross domestic product in the economy has recovered, and it's showing that African, let me put my glasses on, African Americans, I think now I lost it, of course. Yeah, the number, of course. But it's something like 45% of African Americans here living in poverty, the overall percent of poverty is 8%. And the number of Hispanics living here in the area has doubled that are living in poverty. So what I want to ask you guys is if do you have any suggestions for them for now how they can get involved locally with their local municipalities and even school board to where they can make an impact because there's a lot of blight in this area, a lot of abandonment and also with the high poverty that's going on here, how they can locally get involved to impact change and help, in, you know, where there have been a loss of jobs and all that, and start there to fix. And a lot of that has to do with corruption. So first, on, on the corruption front, um, you can pass a gift ban on the city level, on the municipal right. level here mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. We marched through Reading, Pennsylvania last May. Two months later, Reading City Council passed a gift ban. Very easy to do it. It's not easy. It's possible to do. You can pass these democracy reforms or these reforms to reform our republic um, in on very, very local levels. And on second, I want to stress a point here tonight that these corruption issues are not at all detached from poverty and every other issue. They are the connection, they, they are the source, they are the, the driving force behind these things. And when we talk about corruption and democracy, we have to be talking about it, and our republic, sorry, we have to be talking about it in such a way that it connects to what we care about, to our, our daily bread, to our issues, to our jobs, to, to our healthcare, to everything else. And, I, and I'm really saying that because I'm looking around this room and, and I think this room is mostly middle class or, or above that, um, with you know uh, poor people as well for sure. But I, I think that where we are right now in the Radisson Hotel in downtown Scranton kind of speaks to the, a problem that's been in the democracy movement for a few years, which is that we haven't been as good as we need to be in connecting democracy to local issues, in connecting it to issues that matter. And I, I think that uh, so I, I'm sorry I don't really answer your question, but to answer your question, everybody get involved at every level in every way you possibly can. Be as active as you possibly can in your civic life. Advocate for pro-democracy, anti-corruption reforms as often as you possibly can. And advocate for the issues that you care about. The only way a democracy movement happens and moves forward is when we come out of our issue silos and join together for this core issue while still fighting for our issues. Fight against poverty and fight for democracy. Fight against climate change and fight for democracy. It's the only way it, it moves forward. To quote Adam Lincoln. You know what the great thing about that too is that Reading passed one, Bethlehem passed one. That's we don't have to write our own. Did, I have to say. We don't That's have crazy. to write our own. <laughs> mm -hmm. We can use theirs. Yeah, yeah. We just, word for word, man. Go for it. It's easy. You can also add bring it up. I could. So I'm a commissioner yeah. uh, at the, in the local town, and the, there's tons of you know, <clears throat> committees that they can join. Uh, and be a part of. You know, they're non, you know, not a political level, whether it ends up being Parks and Recs or the Shade Tree Committee or whatever it is, and it gives you a nice, well, slow way hey, to involve. Well, start, get out there and start walking through the neighborhoods. Yeah, exactly. And tell them, because they're not gonna know. But I wanna say, the reason why I say this is because I've also been a reporter for 17 mm -hmm. years, and I've been in Lancaster County, and I've covered these meetings, and people don't go. Mm -hmm. They don't show up. It is not just here in Lancaster County. I've gone to meetings in Reading. I've gone in Berks County. I've gone in Florida when I was a reporter in Florida. And they don't show up. And you know, the people who do show up are Republican or the elderly. Or the and lobbyists. Or the, or the lobbyists. lobbyists. Always, yeah. And the, they come to the, and just the last, I haven't, I took a break from being a reporter for a while. And the last meeting I went to was last week. And I want to tell you, guess what I caught? A school board meeting and the school board president approved a contract for a construction project where he said, oh, we're going to let this engineering firm come in. We're going to approve this guy. And, the, and they said, oh, why are we going to approve this guy? Oh, because I've worked with him before. Mm. And because, guess who the school board president is? The school board president is the CEO of an $80 million construction company. So he knows the engineer. So the good thing I was there as a reporter, because I wrote about it, 
that's what reporters are there to do to represent the people, but people should be there to hear it. How many residents are of the University of Pennsylvania is that you also are legally allowed to serve in public office and maintain a side career, which creates incredible amounts of conflicts of interest. Exactly, but he also should have recused himself from that. Okay. How many residents of Luzerne County are in the audience? Great. You can serve on a county authority board or commission just by applying. You don't have to have, you don't have to be elected to it. You're appointed to it. Submit a resume. Look at the list. There's 36 of them. And they do important work. It's volunteer work. But you'll be involved and you don't have to run a campaign. Just go on their website, get the application, send it in to them, get interviewed, and get on something that you care about. I think we're going to wrap it up. Um, I think we have one more question. And then I just ask uh, if everybody can just fill in their papers that are on their seats, just so we have some information for you. We can follow up with you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. But um, I just wanted to be able to give you guys some time just to just say a closing statement. And I think we did have one more question. Yeah, just, just one more thing. You know, you were talking about all of the candidates that are running on the coast. Uh, Peter knows the name Mullery. He's, he's down in the Wilkes Bear area. And I had talked to him about this cap tax issue at one of the one of the board meetings that, as I said, I was a member of the board I think I did, and he went on a couple cap tax uh, groups. And it's, I, I confronted him about this issue, and he said to me, do you realize in the last election, he said that I got 65% of the vote. And I went, uh, didn't you run on a poll? <laughs> what that means to me, that 35% of your constituents hate your guts. <laughs> and that they have enough common sense to go, I oh, only got one part to the tooth, I just got to put an X in the box. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so keep that in mind when you go to the polls. If, if there's an office that's running on a post, think of somebody that has, has a little bit of free time on their hands and let them at least run and show that person that, hey, that 35% that they didn't get might turn to 45 or even 51% and unseat them. Mm -hmm. So think about that. Thank you. Well, I've said enough well. already. So. <laughs> I have never been to a three-hour public meeting about <laughs> democracy. This is really encouraging and exciting, so thank you very much for this. Okay, make sure to volunteer and participate with these groups, because there's a reason why two people from Boston came down here, right? It's because we see potential here, so you guys got to carry the torch. Here. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we hope this was a great uh, presentation of democracy issues and uh, please feel free to uh, leave comments. We'll be happy to answer any other questions that might come up in the comment section. And uh, we'll let you know when our next event is. We do have an event coming up in Cranberry Township. Oh, it's June 14th. Uh, it will feature uh, a, a dual program being put together with March on Harrisburg and American Songs. Uh, Rabbi Michael Pollock will be there. And I'm forgetting who's the American Songs right now. But I will be sending out emails.